morning, everyone. And uh, morning. welcome. Nice to see everyone. Uh, welcome to the March 2021 regularly scheduled CalSTRS board meeting. Ask our staff to take the roll, please. The most famous words of the year, Rosalind, Miss Bell, you're on mute. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, <laughs> Miss Hendricks. Here. Miss Bradford. Here. <laughs> I see you. Um, <clears throat> Mr. Prasant. Here. Miss Erdan. Here. Miss Yamamoto. Here. Miss Miller for the Director of Finance. Here. Good morning. Good morning. Um, Mr. Rafino for the State Treasurer. Present. Good. Um, Mr. Yaman Yamanaka for the Superintendent of Public Instruction. I'm here. And Controller Yi. Oh, this is Lynn Paik. Oh, Lynn Paik. Great. Thank you. All right. So, um, Mr. Chair, you have a quorum. Thanks, Ms. Bell. I know uh, Ms. Joy Heger will be joining us um, later this morning. So we look forward to Joy joining, joining us uh, later on this morning. Uh, I would like to have the committee agenda approved for today or amended. Uh, any approval for the committee agenda? I'll move approval, Mr. Chair. Is there a second? Second. second. Okay. It's been moved and properly seconded to approve the agenda for today. Without objection, the agenda has been approved. Before we go to our first item of the day, I would like to recognize Sharon for a couple of, uh, for two or three minute comment. Sharon. Okay, thank you, Harry. Um, we just, uh, on behalf of the board chair, Harry Keeley and myself, we just wanted to take a moment to acknowledge the fact that um, as, as Harry stated, it's March 2021, but if you guys remember back to March 2020, I was just reading through kind of the news of that month last year, and, um, you know, it, it marks the anniversary of the shutdown of our schools and the shutdown of pretty much everything in California and a lot of other states. And so we wanted to mark this anniversary just by making a few remarks Um and first, I just wanted to, to um, thank our CalSTR staff. You know, we've been, as chair and vice chair of the board, we've been in, in constant communication with staff, but recognize, you know, I think we're all just feeling it after a year. The transition to working from home is really challenging. So we just want to say, staff of CalSTRs, thank you so much for all the work. There's no words that can express, uh, you know, our gratitude for just how you've handled this with incredible grace as well as performance levels not dropping, uh, it, that's extraordinary to me. So we just wanna say thank you to CalSTRS staff and all of you watching, I would say in the building, but you're all at home. So um, so thank you to the staff. Um, but I also wanna just to recognize none of us would be here. We wouldn't have a board. We wouldn't have a CalSTRS building and staff if it weren't for uh, California's teachers. So I'm gonna try to keep it together because um, I see Karen right next to me as a, you know, as a teacher. So, um, but I just wanted to, you know, recognize, you know, I don't know about you, but I'm tired. <laughs> I think we're all kind of emotionally drained. We just wanted to take a moment to say thank you to teachers. Um, I, I, I acknowledge the pre-K teachers, the elementary educators, the junior high, middle school teachers, high school, adult ed. I don't want to miss anyone. The substitutes, those who provide additional services like special education to our children the full and part-time community college faculty, counselors, librarians, um, the retirees who are enjoying their CalSTRS pension right now, but have given a lifetime of service to uh, students in California. We thank you for that. And um, we just recognize that many of you have families um, of your own. Some of our board members have families of their own. And when you're trying to teach online, but also manage your kids who are trying to learn online, um, just acknowledge um, that that's a lot. And it's been a lot this year. And so we just wanna say, we see you, uh, we feel with you. I think the key word for me this year has been empathy, that in the midst of all this stress, we just need to kind of come together and say like, 
we see you, we feel you, we acknowledge this, the challenges that we've all gone through um, and trust that um, we're gonna move through this. And so with, with that, we just wanted to acknowledge too that I'm getting my first shot on, on Saturday. I don't know about the rest of the educators watching this today, um, but I'm hopeful um, you know, that in March we'll have educators um, vaccinated, we'll have students and parents vaccinated. Obviously President Biden and our governor are putting a lot of resources to try and get schools back in order. I know um, as an educator myself, we're working hard to make sure those schools are safe to come back to for teachers and for students and for staff and administrators. Um, but I'm confident that uh, if we work as a team that we'll be able to accomplish that. So I'm um, looking forward to that day. I'm looking forward to the day that our board meets in person. I'm looking forward to the day that students and teachers can be back in the classroom safely. Um, but we just wanted to say thank you. Thank you. Thank you, educators of California. We wouldn't be here without you and just appreciate the hard work you've done. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Sharon. We love you and uh, we appreciate you so much. Um, so let's go to our first item on the agenda here, which is state and federal legislation. Uh, Joyce Lynn Martinez Wade is with us and there are two pieces of legislation, one here in California and one federal legislation that many of us are familiar with. So let me turn it over to Joycelyn. Joycelyn, we'll take these uh, one at a time um, so you can go through the state and then uh, we'll take action on that and then here on the federal legislation. Joycelyn. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. Good morning, members of the board. Um, the bill introduction deadline at the state level was February 19th, so we only have one bill for you today, but I will, after we've taken action on these two bills, go over what the plan is for the next um, meeting and for the other bills that have been introduced. Unfortunately, we weren't able to get them analyzed and discussed in time to bring them to you today. But as the chair said, we'll start with SB 294 by Senator Leva, and I'll give a quick summary. That bill removes the 12-year service credit limit for members who are serving as elected officers. This conforms with SB 1095, which 1085, excuse me, which was passed in 2018 and provides parity among public employees. SB 1085 provided without time constraint for public employees to serve as stewards or elected officers. So again, this bill removes that 12 year limit. It impacts a very small population of our members right now. And 2019-20, there were 40 members who were reported as being on a leave of absence for elected officer service. And because of that minimal impact, the recommendation is for the board to take a neutral position. Thanks, Joycelyn. Any questions uh, for Joycelyn or thoughts? Okay, seeing, seeing none. Um, the staff recommendation is a neutral position. Is that correct, Joycelyn? Is that is there, correct. Is there a motion to uh, accept this? Uh, moved by Sharon. Second. Seconded by Denise. Questions or comments? Uh, Gail. Just simply, Mr. Chair, that I'm gonna abstain from this vote. I, however you do it, please. Sure. Thank you. Got it. Thanks. Great. Bill, Gary, uh, yeah. jump in, Bill. Is our position on this neutral at the point at this point? Yes. And so, what's the purpose of this motion? It hasn't officially taken a position yet. This would be the time to take action to have that neutral position officially. Oh, okay. I I, I understand now. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Bill. Great, so I'll note the abstention from Ms. Miller, um, but Ms. Hendricks? Yes. Ms. Uh, Bradford? Yes. Mr. Prezant? Yes. Ms. Erdan? Yes. Ms. Yamamoto? I think that was an aye. Um, aye, yes, sorry. Mr. Rafino? Aye. Uh, Mr. Yamanaka? Aye. Ms. Paquin? Aye. Okay, and um, Mr. Chair, would you like to vote? Aye. Okay, all right. Thank you, Ms. Bell. Joycelyn, the next piece of uh, legislation from the federal uh, legislation. 
It's HR 82 by Congressman Davis from Illinois. This is the uh, perennial legislation that eliminates the government pension offset and the windfall elimination provision from the Social Security Act. The government pension offset was added to reflect the dual entitlement role that it takes part in the Social Security benefits for um, couples that have both are in Social Security and the windfall elimination provision was added to remove perceived advantage for individuals with employment not covered by Social Security. The board's policy is to support legislation that repeals those offsets because since CalSTRS members do not participate in Social Security, any Social Security benefit they expect to receive are affected by these offsets, the WEP and the GPO, and often comes as a surprise to them, therefore minimizing any income they expected to receive from Social Security in retirement. So again, because of the board policy, the recommendation is for the board to take a support position on HR 82. Thank you, Joycelyn. Questions? Seeing no hands, uh, is there a motion to approve the staff recommendation? Moved by Sharon, is there a second? Seconded by second. Karen. Moved by Sharon, seconded by Karen. Okay, great, thank you. Seeing any, any, I don't see any hands for discussion. So Ms. Bell, would you take the roll please? Sure. Um, Ms. Hendricks? Yes. Ms. Bradford? Yes. Mr. Prasad? Yes. Ms. Erdan? Yes. Ms. Yamamoto? Aye. Um, Ms. Miller? Yes. Um, Mr. Fino? Yes. Mr. Yamanaka? Aye. Ms. Paquin? Aye. All right, and Mr. Chair, would you like to vote? Aye. Great, all right, thank you. Thank you. Joycelyn, uh, there's a title, um, a heading called placeholder. Right, and so as I mentioned before, we weren't able to prepare bills for that for you today, but there are five other bills that we'll be bringing to the board for a position. There are two divestment bills that will be up in committee before you next meet in May. And so the plan right now is to take those to the chair and vice chair using their delegated authority to take positions on those bills so that we can express where the board stands on those in committee, um, make sure our voice is heard on those. Then there are three bills that are on track to be brought to the board in May for a position. I also wanted to mention that we're tracking nearly 200 bills that relate to CalSTRS in a variety of different ways, some as a state agency, some related to climate risk, all sorts of different perspectives. But among those, I just did, wanted to mention a theme that we're seeing. There are several, nine in total thus far, um, bills dealing with state agency and other public meetings. And it seems like that's largely because of the remote nature of meetings at this point in time, just like this one. Um, some of these bills deal with posting materials and agenda or making sure to continue a virtual platform for members of the public to participate. Some deal with translation services. And I just wanted to bring that to your attention. We'll be reviewing those, tracking them and keeping you updated on them and how they affect you. Is that it, Joycelyn? Okay, we do have a a couple of hands, Bill. Uh, yeah, uh, Joycelyn, what uh, delegation of authority do we give to the chair and vice chair for what legislation? Is that the divestment legislation? They're able to take positions on any legislation if timing is necessary to do so. Yeah. So if we need I wanna know the nature of the, of the legislation. Sure, the two bills specifically this time that I mentioned have to do with divestment from Turkish investment vehicles. In the past, the board has taken opposed positions on those types of bills. There are uh, two bills, AB 1019 by Assemblymember Holden and SB 457 by Senator Portantino. They approach the divestment in a little bit of a different way, uh, but those are basically the what those bills are seeking to do. And so in the past, we've, we've uh, not taken a position or we've opposed? In the past on divestment bills, we generally, the board has taken an imposed position and specifically- And so, and so the delegation of authority would, would uh, hopefully be consistent with past conduct of the board. That is not required, but it makes sense. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I think before we delegate authority on things like this, 
that we have some idea, you know, because th there may be, I'm not suggesting that there, in this instance there would be, but just as a matter of governance, I don't want to delegate my fiduciary duty, uh, you know, in, in, in support or in opposition to legislation without knowing the nature of it and without having some idea of what we've done in the past and that if, 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 we, if we've done something in the past and that it would be consistent with our uh, policies. Uh, because, you know, uh, the, the concept of, of delegation of authority because of timing is one thing, but, uh, you know, we can't delegate that authority. I can't delegate my fiduciary duty on things like that, just to be clear. Joycelyn, if you could, and I see Brian online. I was just going to suggest Brian get on. <laughs> would, uh, I think it would be um, helpful if someone could put into context how this um, provision delegating the, this authority or delegating to the chair and vice chair, how that came about historically, because historically that was not there. And it, if my memory serves me correct, it's probably within the last two years or so where this was adopted by the board and as to the why it was adopted by the board because I think Bill's concerns are extremely legitimate and has been debated by the board and legal counsel and staff before we adopted it. But because the nature of our board, we have new members coming in all the time. I think it's important to have context as to how the why this delegated authority is there for the chair and the vice chair and the limited times that it will be used. So um, I'll let uh, Joycelyn really fill out the, the why. It really has to do with the legislative timing. Uh, what I would say to your concerns, Bill, is um, one, there is a legislation policy in your board governance manual that actually specifically describes what the board's position will be on various uh, items depending upon what they contain. So those parameters are already in your policy. And then this particular, there's a, also this is in your policy as well. This delegation was adopted by the full board as a, a policy, but there are limits around it. It really is almost like an emergent uh, authority. And that is when there's something pending, fits within your policy that you would normally take a position or not take a position on. And we're unable to summon all of you together because of the restrictions on your meetings and your calendar that this particular sub policy, and we can send it to you, makes it very clear that the chair and vice chair can take a position, but it has to be consistent with your already adopted legislation policy. Well, you know, that, that, that is, you know, in, in the sense then the motion should be uh, delegating the authority consistent with the policies uh, outlined. I think okay. that would be, be a, a, a better way of wording the motion, because now that I know that there are policy guidelines, I, I, I didn't know that. I apologize. Uh, you know, I'm fine with it uh, as long as it's consistent with our policy, which sets criteria in which it's going to be exercised. Excellent point. Thank you. Sorry to sorry to raise that. Not so, at all. Bill. It's a good You're a great fiduciary. We love it. I'm sure others had this had same concern. So I'm glad we've got clarity on that. Uh, any other questions for Joycelyn? I had a quick one. I, I'm sorry, I, I do see there, there are a couple. Okay. Sharon and then Frank. Oh, Frank, go ahead. You go ahead. I'll I'll defer to you, Frank. Oh, <clears throat> uh, thank you, and thank you, Jocelyn, for the uh, uh, report. I have a quick question about, you know, the the idea of who should pay for pension mistakes. You know, that's been uh, sort of uh, on the. Uh, on the legislative radar, Senator Oliva uh, submitted legislation, as you probably recall, which ultimately Governor Brown uh, vetoed. <clears throat> and now she's reintroducing that bill. I believe it's uh, Senate Bill 278. Um, I know that that's specific to CalPERS. Does that have any impact or effect on CalSTRS at all? Uh, number one. And then number two, just in general, do we have as Calsters, do we have those sort of uh, similar issues about pension mistakes or the same challenges that CalPERS has? SB 278 does not affect Calsters. As you noted, it's CalPERS and it's related to the Public Employees Pension Reform Act and changes made because of that. Um, 
our collection of overpayments proposal that we presented in December 2020 is related in nature to SB 278. And so we were looking at those issues with that proposal, as you'll call, we were we did not move forward with that for 2021 for legislation in 2021, but are slated to come back to the board in November to go over any other proposals that we're able to put together. We are putting, there's a work group that's put together and there's an update on that in the CEO report and there was as well in the last board meeting. And so internal work continues on those issues. And we will also be working with stakeholders once we're able to go through our internal process. Great, yes, I do recall that. So we, there's no, Senate, the Senate Bill 278 doesn't have no relation or impact on our board, if I understand. Okay, great, thank you. Thanks, Frank. Sharon? Yeah, my, my question kind of relates back to, to Bill's questions, which I think are good questions. I think anytime we're talking about fiduciary duty, I think it's uh, completely, uh, I, I appreciate Bill's line of questioning. And I did wonder, um, Jocelyn, when we do this, when we do this delegated authority, is there a way to send the legislation to all board members so they can see what Harry and I are deciding about between so that folks just have the, the bill in front of them so they can take a look at it? Or, or what's the process for that? Requirement in the policy is to notify the board and I believe it's immediately, but we, so we send out a notification to the board when a position is taken in such a manner and then we report out at the next board meeting. So there'll be an analysis included in the materials in May. Thanks, Sharon. I don't see any other hands. Uh, Joycelyn, before you go, let me just check with Samantha. Are there any members of the public that want to address the board on this item? There are no members of the public in queue right now. Thank you. Joycelyn, thank you for the presentation. Thank you. Brings us to our next item, item three, which is the review of the long-term uh, incentive plan, the LTIP. You have Luis Navas, our lead compensation consultant from Global Governance Advisors and Melissa Norsha, head of HR for CalSTRS. Let me turn it over to, and then this is an information item for uh, the objective here is for um, us to provide Luis and Melissa some additional feedback on the objective of adopting a long-term incentive pay program uh, that would uh, ideally come back in May for uh, action and implementation starting July of 2021. Let me turn it over to uh, Melissa. Good morning, Melissa. Uh, good morning, Chair Keeley, and good morning, everyone. Uh, so this item is refreshing the full board on the long-term incentive proposal background and the recommended framework um, that, the, that was presented to the compensation committee almost, well, almost a year ago. And um, at that time, it was um, a mighty group of five board members that were on the comp committee that provided feedback uh, and direction to Luis Navas and myself, Luis being the primary compensation strategist to the committee. Um, now, if you recall, this item is being presented to the full board because of the LTIP's linkage to the collaborative model and the board wanting to receive um, updates collectively. So if you think of the LTIP and its connection to the collaborative model, it really is that people strategy of the model. So essentially ensuring that we are growing, um, retaining, attracting the right talent to support and execute on the collaborative model strategies. As um, Chairperson Keeley mentioned, this is an information item. Uh, so um, it's not an action item. And it's an opportunity for the full board to provide um, feedback. So I really look forward to a, a rich discussion on this very important strategy. Uh, before I hand it over to Luis Navas, I did wanna let the board know that Scott Chan and I believe Chris Aylman are in the wings. Uh, the framework does include a cost savings measure. So to the extent that I'm sure the board will have questions about them, they are available to um, respond to your questions. So Luis, I will pass it over to you to um, update the board. Thank you, uh, Melissa, and uh, good morning to everyone. 
Um, so uh, the issue of the long-term incentive plan first came up about four years ago uh, when the board was undertaking its uh, compensation review uh, that it does uh, regularly. Uh, it was identified by McLaughlin and us, uh, the LTIP is, the lack of an LTIP as being a competitive issue relative to the board's compensation policy. We then spent more time, frankly, looking at it when it became more of a strategic issue relating to the collaborative uh, investment strategy. Uh, we had a, an open session with the entire board in November of uh, 2019 to get everyone's input around the uh, existing compensation policy. And here on slide one, I summarize some of the themes that came out of uh, that and this was presented, uh, as Melissa mentioned, to the Compensation Committee about a year ago, but we're, we're showing it again for the benefit of the uh, full board. But one of the key items that did come up uh, from uh, the board uh, in terms of themes from that session was the, the need to look at a long-term incentive plan um, as part of moving towards the collaborative investment model. Luis, before you continue, are you referencing slides that are supposed to be in front of us at this point? Yes. Okay, on my video, I don't have a, a copy of the slides. I don't need, personally don't need them. Does everyone else have the slides in front of you that Luis is referencing? Some of us do, some of us don't. I definitely recommend that they, they be up if possible. My apologies, we, we're getting that right. Thank you, Jonathan. So we'll just take Here they come, there they are. Thank you, continue, Luis, thank you. Thanks, Jonathan. Thanks, Jonathan. So, so Jonathan, yeah, I'm just, that was, uh, so we'll just move to slide uh, two now. Uh, so on slide two, uh, some of the rationale that we outlined to the committee a year ago in terms of, of why the need to adopt the long-term incentive plan at CalSTRS I won't go through each and every one of them. Uh, the, the key one from our firm's perspective is, you know, we've always had the committee look at compensation from a perspective, not just kind of internal compensation, but total compensation, including external fund management costs being one of the largest uh, compensation costs that uh, CalSTRS has. Um, and so we, you know, we have the view that the long-term incentive plan is a tool that allows CalSTRS to really reduce those external fund management costs significantly by instead of using those third party firms, actually hiring the talent that allows you to manage those funds directly. Just moving to slide three. There are uh, currently at Kelsters uh, three buckets of compensation. Uh, there's base salary, uh, short-term or annual incentive compensation, and then pension and benefits. Um, as we've uh, shown the committee in the past, uh, it is more typical amongst CalSTRS peer group to have that fourth bucket, which is the long-term incentive plan. And I'll explain that in a bit more detail in the uh, slides to come. Uh, on slide four now, uh, this is uh, really a, a key slide and strategic uh, slide. Uh, this is uh, uh, put together by us with data provided by staff and vetted by the investment management group at CalSTRS. It basically outlines the potential savings over a one-year, five-year, and 10-year period uh, in terms of external compensation costs um, by implementing the collaborative investment model. And as you can see, you know, the savings are quite significant, and therefore the provision for long-term incentive plan that is one of, one of the tools that allows you to um, you know, generate and, uh, those savings uh, is really a, a normal amount uh, relative to the potential savings. I'm just moving to slide five. Um, here's just a, a general outline as to how we would recommend the LTIP design to work for CalSTRS. Um, we are recommending a performance period of four years. Um, there are some pension funds uh, within the peer group at CalSTRS that would have a three-year, some would that have a five-year. Uh, we would recommend a four-year from the perspective that it is kind of the majority market practice. Uh, and it also allows more of a fair timeline to achieve the performance criteria that we're setting out. Um, 
the way that the plan design would work is that it would be probably you know, very unique from a worldwide perspective. Most, if not all, pension fund LTIPs that exist today are based off of total fund return performance. Um, we are, uh, with input that we've received from the committee, um, we are recommending that savings from the collaborative model be incorporated into the LTIP design. And we think that having those two measures um, not only represent a kind of a good governance model, but I think also sends a, a, a positive message to all the stakeholder groups within CalSTRS. Um, I'll talk a bit about the payout curve in the next, uh, in, this, in one of the next slides, because it'll show it better from an illustrative perspective. Uh, the last point I'll just make is the, there is no payout. Uh, so if an award is made in say the beginning of July of this year, uh, if, uh, and only if the uh, performance measures are achieved, uh, there would not be any type of award payout uh, until year five. And you'll see that in a moment. Just moving on to, to slide six. Um, for those of you that, that just haven't had the benefit of some of the uh, discussions that the committee has had over the last few years uh, from us, the if, if you kind of look at the differentials between a long-term incentive and a short-term incentive plan, a short-term incentive plan is almost always based off of a 12-month performance period and then paid within the first quarter after that uh, first year if the performance has been achieved. Uh, under the long-term incentive plan and specifically the four-year performance period that we're recommending, um, there is no payout uh, until after the four-year period and uh, assuming that the uh, performance objectives have been achieved. If an individual employee that is receiving an LTIP leaves during that four-year period uh, to join a competitor, uh, they would leave uh, everything on the table and lose uh, all compensation related to that. So it's it's got a uh, what we like about it. It's got a strong uh, retention factor. Uh, just moving on to slide seven. Um, this is kind of just a, a good illustration to show what I, what I was talking about earlier in terms of the payout curve. Again, we want to make sure that the payout curve is something that's highly defensible by the board uh, to its stakeholder groups. Um, so the way we've uh, designed it here is we have said that if a 7% uh, four-year rolling average total fund return is not achieved, and the 7%, the logic behind that is, is using the CalSTRS actuarial threshold. Uh, if you know if 6.999% uh, is achieved uh, over a four-year rolling average, there would be a zero payout. Um, and the other element of the design that I wanted to outline is that there is a cap, uh, and we think that you know, unlike there are long term, many most long term incentive plans in say you know, private sector or publicly traded companies would uh, not have a cap. Um, we are recommending a, a cap uh, within this LTIP, and that would be more typical, frankly, within LTIP designs in pension funds. Um, so with that, I will open up to any uh, questions that people may have. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, on a second. Uh, I'm getting a lot of feedback here. Let me just check. Feedback is gone. Great. Um, uh, we do have a few hands, starting with Controller Yee. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you for the presentation. Um, just wanted to ask um, a question about the uh, four-year period that was selected. Is that a, I guess, is that a, a, a standard across peers? Or um, I, I know CalPERS, we have a five-year period, but um, just uh, if you could comment about that. Yeah, so four-year would be what you'd see the majority practice within the, the pension sector. Um, the uh, pension funds that have a three-year uh, um, have to do that because of certain tax rules uh, in the regions that they operate in. Um, the the five-year uh, would be uh, more of a minority uh, type of an example, but you know we, we would recommend the four-year based on the majority of pension funds having that period. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's uh, helpful. Uh, so then on slide five, where you note uh, that the first payout wouldn't be made until 
24-25. Wouldn't the four year actually take that first award to 25-26? Uh, it would be within. It would be within the first quarter of the fifth year that we paid. Uh, we've got the uh, the year incorrect. Uh, I'd have to just double check, but it would be the first quarter of the of the of the, of the year, year following. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Following the four year period. Okay. Got it. And then, um, just I guess on an ongoing basis, um, how are the savings? Um, from the collaborative model gonna be calculated. Um, I need to talk about it in terms of near term, but on an ongoing basis. Sure, I'll, I'll have to defer, I'm gonna defer that to uh, staff to answer that. So while we're waiting, I, there you go, Scott. Um, I'll let you go ahead and take that one. Yeah, so um, thanks for the question, Betty. We, we sure. would uh, take our annual cost report and uh, likely um, create specific measures around that, which, which don't exist today, but which we, we have all the information in the baseline to do so. Uh -huh. um, so we would create that and, and um, sometime before uh, we, could, we could show those measurements, hopefully to, to the board before we, we begin um, executing. Okay. Chris, I don't know if you had further thoughts on that or. No, and I just, and I bet you would care. We're also talking to consultants uh, that would at least give us a reasonableness. Yeah. Uh, affirmation, maybe not a full audit because it's mm -hmm. hard to do these things, but at least uh, give you some comfort that these numbers are real uh, and our methodology is sound. Okay, good. Very helpful. Thank you. And then um, in the event that um, we decide to change the discount rate, uh, would that impact the LTIP uh, calculation in subsequent years? I, I, I mean, I, I imagine it would, but- uh, It would, yeah. yeah. We, we, we would recommend if you, if you ever decrease it or increase it, that it, it match that, because again, it's all about the message that we're trying to send to yeah. stakeholders. Okay, so just track with whatever um, that uh, would be. Okay, great, thank you. Thank you, Harry. Thank you. Chris and Scott, we love having you on screen. Why don't you guys drop off and then drop back on when, when uh, we need you as much as we like seeing you guys. Okay, thank you. Um, let's, we do have uh, in the order of the hands before me, we have Gail, Karen, Jennifer, and then Bill. So we'll go to Gail. And thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Just a few questions and I really appreciate all the work and, and really the thoughtfulness and the responsiveness to where we were last time. Um, I, I do just want to note that, and I understand this is part of the pillars project, but we do talk a lot about how we're using the savings from the collaborative models. So I just, I, I just want to be super consistent with that. So for example, we just funded positions with that. So I, I, I'd like to see some consistency kind of across the board. I understand it's a big savings and that's really deliberate. So I never want to sort of make it quite as binary as, as, you know, culture or, or um, hires. I, I just, I, I'm a, still a little bit concerned about the language we use around that. So let's just continue to be mindful that, that we have more to offer from the collaborative model than just the savings and the LTIPs. So I, I do think there's a reason we have the people we have. Um, it was part of the reason I asked so many questions yesterday about our ability to meet the expectations of the semi-annual report was in fact to make sure like that we we can hire folks. And the answer kind of overwhelmingly yesterday was absolutely, we can continue to hire and fulfill our asset allocation as we move towards. And as you know, we're really supportive of moving towards an LTIP and again, appreciate the responsiveness, but just wanna make sure that we continue to sort of use all of our resources while we're getting there. So I, I remain a little bit concerned about the binary nature of this conversation. And, and also, I just don't want there to be, I love the long-term approach to this, but we do already have, um, you know, we have some incentives in our CAFR. And, you know, when we look at the past four years, there was a six point or three years, there was a 6.8% rate of return. So it's slightly below that um, the assumed 7% rate of return. So I just want to make sure that I understand that the 7% is also over a period of time. It's not year over year. 
And so if we were looking backwards, obviously 2020 will make a huge difference in this. We wouldn't have quite gotten there. So I, is that correct, Mr. It's, correct. it's based okay. on a four-year rolling average. Okay, so just making sure, I love that idea of that four-year rolling average, but, um, and also having some automatic ability to say that whatever the discount rate is, that's what we have to stick to, even if that changes midterm, I think is important. Um, and then just in terms of kind of the efficacy, and I know this is what Mr. Chan is doing with the Pillars Project, that whether or not the cost savings as the sole metric of success beyond the, the 7%, um, you know, if, if that's really how we want it, the best way to reflect the efficacy of the collaborative model for purposes of this incentive package. Again, I, I, I think these are really important questions. I understand that in order to get where we wanna go, we need some version of an LTIP. I just wanna make sure we've really sort of dug into some of these important questions as we move forward, because as we know, as you guys would say, is it across the river, or across the pond, whatever we say about our sister agency, um, we have some real competitive advantages that really don't exist anywhere else. So it's how we, I just, I never hear about that kind of when we're talking about these things and I really wanna make sure we are. So that's sort of my general question about how we're measuring the efficacy of that. And our collaborative model in and of itself is going to be part of our attraction because it's a whole lot more fun for people in this business to get to work in these partnerships and have people that want to work with them. So I just never want to lose sight of kind of that piece of it. And then again, just the long-term benefit of being in a divine, defined benefit plan, I think is, is a super important piece. So I would love all of that to be part of our LTIP consideration rather than just the compensation, which again, we really want to get to supporting. So none of this is meant to be negative. And I think you've come so far and appreciate the responsiveness. It's a good point, Gil. And, and I think, you know, the committee for the benefits of, of the board members that haven't you know, been on the committee for the last uh, several years, you know, we, we do spend time always talking as a group about the fact that we don't want compensation be, to be the only reason that people join and stay at, at Kelsters. We talk a lot about the fact that there are other important variables, non-compensation related variables as to why, um, you know, people come and stay at Kelsters. And, and I think, you know, Gail's identified a couple, but, you know, you know, Sharon started this, the meeting today talking about the, the culture at, at Kelsters. And, I, I, you know, from our experience in working with many pension funds across the world, CalSTRS has a very positive culture and that carries value. We do want to make sure that at the end of the day, compensation is fair and competitive, um, but you know, paying top decile doesn't necessarily get you the best. Um, and, and I think Gail is absolutely correct. And so we, we've tried to keep that all um, uh, together and we will keep that together going forward. Thanks, Luis. Luis. Gail, is yeah. that... <laughs> that's it. Okay, I'm gonna step, move back a little bit here, <laughs> close to the microphone. Uh, Karen, Jennifer, and then Bill. Karen. Okay. Hi. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for the presentation, Luis and uh, Melissa. Um, my questions concerned uh, the same ones that uh, Controller Yi had about the four year. Um, a lot of the, the numbers that we get are one year, three year, 10 year, and, and beyond that. What, and you explained about the four year because it's like the majority practice that the five year is maybe too, too long of a time. Um, so, so I'm still not, can you talk about the, the four year again in terms of the three year that we always report out, that's always reported out? And then, sure. um, yeah, just to talk a little bit about that too, because it's confusing to me as, as to what numbers we're going to be using as well. Sure. So the, the rationale from our perspective of using a four-year rolling average to calculate the, um, the, the total fund return to achieve, um, if you look at the three-year and you break it down in terms of, of CalSTRS peer group, uh, almost everybody that uses a three-year it's really for tax reasons. The, re the regions in which they operate in uh, does not allow a cash plan, a cash LTA plan to, to be paid out beyond a three-year period. So that's why most of those pension funds 
have that. Calsters and, and CalPERS do not have that issue based on the regions that, that it operates in. Uh, the, it then takes you to a four year or a five year. I also don't like a three year for the reason that Gail mentioned, which is, you know, it, you want, you need more time than three years to try to achieve the 7%. You know, it's, as Gail outlined, the 7%, if you look at the historical performance of the fund, it's a, it's a challenging number to hit, right? And that's, that, that's okay, as long as we all feel that it's attainable. You wanna make sure that it's attainable at the end of the day, and we do think that it is. But giving staff that extra year to a four year period to try to hit the number, I think it has great value. Um, the, on, the, on the fifth year perspective, very few organizations out there have a five year. It's, it's really not the norm. Um, and part of it is you start asking your question, it, is that almost too long from the employee side to wait to achieve and receive uh, their awards? And so those are the rationales uh, that gets us to the four year. And then the last point that I mentioned is, you know, well over half of, of, of Calster's peer group that has an LTIP uh, uses the four year period. So just to you know, be, be competitive also. Okay, so as a follow-up then on that question, so so the first the first payout would if it starts next year, right? Um, the twenty twenty, I forget what year it is, but but if it starts the year one that we want to do it, and then we wait the four years, and then the first quarter of the fifth year is when they get it. Okay, so then does that mean in year two, does that start the next four years? Correct. And then, then, the, then that fifth year, first quarter of that fifth year segment would be another um, incentive plan re, uh, reward. Correct. Is that how and that goes? That, okay. Yeah, that's exactly right, Karen. And that's where- so Kind of leapfrogs then? Uh, no leapfrogs. It's, it's, it's uh, uh, an annual award, but it doesn't get paid out until five years later. So okay. after, you know, after a four year period, the first four years is completed, you know, you, there'll, there'll be this, uh, assuming performance is hit, uh, there'll be this, this uh, annual uh, payout uh, to be received. And that's where it really becomes very strong retention factor, where if somebody wants to uh, try to recruit your, your senior team uh, of high achievers, it, and, um, it becomes really hard to pull them out. And that's, okay. we like that. Okay, and then if another question, uh, Mr. Chair, on the, on the issue of retention then, um, so I think I asked this in our, in our um, previous conversation with you, but if a, you said that the payout will not be rewarded if, awarded if the, the employee leaves, right? But what happens and are, are there safeguards in place or are there guidelines in place if something happens to that employee, like, death, severe injury, or, or catastrophic uh, um, health issues or things like that? Is that, is that something that's in place already? Uh, it's not. So uh, if, if, uh, if the board uh, gives us guidance to continue to implement this, um, one of the next steps would be we would prepare an LTIP administration document that would govern how this plan is, is managed. Uh, as part of that, we would outline the triggers, uh, the vesting triggers for it. And our recommendation, frankly, would be that if somebody leaves within the four year period to join a competitor, they lose it all. Uh, we, we don't wanna pay anybody who's, who's going uh, to a competitor. If he or she is um, going through what we call a, a good lever, such as retirement, uh, proper retirement, uh, uh, where they're truly retiring, they're not retiring and, and, and remaining, uh, going to a competitor, uh, or death, um, we would normally see that those people have an accelerated vesting on a prorated basis of their LTIP. Um, it would, we don't see the point, and the market doesn't typically do this, to penalize somebody who's dedicated and perform well for the organization under death or retirement. Okay, or even catastrophic illness or something like that where they're incapacitated in any way. Correct. Okay, all right. Um, that's all, Mr. Chair, thank you. Thank you, Karen. 
next is uh, Jennifer and then Keith. I saw Bill, you, you dropped your, your, lowered your hand. Okay. So, I am. My, my questions have been asked and answered. Thank you. Thanks, Bill. Jennifer and then Keith. Thanks so much, Harry, and, and I echo the thanks as well for the terrific presentation and also for um, this initiative, which I uh, support as being very important. Most of my questions were answered. I do have um, one open question, which is just around the vesting. And I was wondering if um, it had been considered or if we look more broadly at the competition for talent, if some sort of a linear in some formulation vest would be appropriate as opposed to the cliff vesting, um, as long as we're seeing the savings through the collaborative model. Can you give me an example of that? I'm not sure I'm, I'm, I'm following. Where, um, let's say the first year you have vested say 25% and something that, so that you're easing into it as opposed to what I'm meaning by clip is that it's all in the fourth year to be paid in the fifth year. And yet if it come, if it scales in at a low enough percentage, then it still gives flexibility should there be uh, changes in the returns or the savings over time. Yeah, so I, I think what you're likely uh, giving the example to is what you would normally see in the private sector. Um, that is definitely the, the norm. Um, and it's, it's, it's the norm when using uh, true uh, typical equity or long-term incentive plan equity, such as stock options or restricted stock units and that. What we're dealing with in pension funds, such as Calsters is since you're, you're, you're not a public, you know, publicly traded vehicle and that, we've got to work within the tax laws. Um, and there, there, there does uh, arise issues. If you start to do, you know, vesting of a quarter, a quarter, a quarter, where the IRS actually deems that as, as an award. And so you have potentially situations where the employee is get, gets taxed, but hasn't actually potentially received any monies yet to pay that tax. And so that's one of the okay. reasons. Is... But you're right, yeah. you're so right, you in the private sector that you would see that. Okay, and you don't have the same lack of certainty, if you will. Anyway, different tax code. Okay, exactly. thank you on that. And then um, the only other thing I would encourage that we think about, and hopefully this will not be the case, but um, I support the triggers for accelerated vesting in the types of cases that were mentioned. I also um, would support thinking through for new hires if there might be times where we set people um, on, a, on a different clock, you know, hopefully we'll be over the target and this wouldn't be an issue, but if we're ever under the target, having something to work with, again, all within budget considerations, fairness, equality, and everything else. Yeah, there will be, there will be some things that we have, if, if, uh, if the board decides to, to move forward with this, that we will have to come back to you to discuss um, and, and, you know, there will be some, some unique things that you'll be presented with around the LTIP upon, you know, new people that are hired, especially if, for example, as you probably know from your experience, Jennifer, if somebody was already receiving an LTIP um, and they, lo they lose that LTIP, you know, they, they may want some kind of uh, uh, compensation for what they're leaving behind. And, and so that's something that we'll have to, you know, outline and talk about as a group. Terrific. And I love that it's on the total fund portfolio as well. So anyway, thank you very much. You're welcome. My pleasure. Thank you, Jennifer. Keith. Yeah, thank you. Uh, being new to this particular conversation, um, some of the questions I have may be a little um, basic, but um, um, some of the, uh, the the concepts that support the long a long term incentive to me uh, would that I would suggest that at least there be some thought given to these concepts. And that is that the um, in terms of the timeline, you know, I, uh, there you have to work through all the practical and tax implications and things like that. Understand, but uh, it would be nice to be able to say that or made logical to be able to say that a, a long-term investment uh, or incentive plan actually corresponds in some way to the long-term benefit to the, um, to, the, to the fund. 
which in, which is supported by the teachers, the employers, and the taxpayers. Um, and I understand the concept of an annual kind of uh, um, measure uh, incentive to conform to a short-term perspective. But sometimes if, if in fact um, a particular, uh, I don't know, asset class or something has investments that may take a period of time that's a little bit longer, how do you measure that? Um, how, how do you determine something uh, on an arbitrary four-year basis if it will take five to 10 years of, you know, for a, an investment undertaken by one of the staff to actually pay out to or mature fully enough to be able to determine the actual effect on the fund? You may have short-term kind of estimates or measures, but in the long term, it comes down to, did it make money or not for the fund, irrespective of what it may or may have done in any particular year, especially if you haven't cashed out of it. So um, that's a little bit, of, um, perhaps that's uh, something that is separate and apart from an incentive plan, but it does seem that there is some kind of connection between an incentive plan and the purposes of that incentive plan to the overall benefit of, of uh, the teachers and the employers and the state. Um, the other thing is in, uh, what, what is measurable and what is not. There are things in our, uh, we establish benchmarks, but it may be something that this board may have to start considering in terms of the, the benchmarks are necessary and accepted, but there are also other measures of the contributions that this fund needs to take account of because all, all the investment returns being what people are really highlighting in terms of uh, where much of the, um, the, the, the funding to pay out future benefits is going to be reliant are, are also still dependent on contributions by members and contributions by employers and contributions by the state, which are all overall affected by the overall economy and certain types of policies that are being run, uh, you know, uh, followed, developed and followed. So um, to the extent that our policies in investing may actually reflect things that may or may not be positive to the strengths of our communities to, to raise sales and property taxes or affect that or affect labor within a local that then affects their ability to pay teachers because they're, you know, and the state's ability out of its revenues to be able to pay. Somehow that connection has to be, uh, I, I think is important even if indirect and not normally considered as part of these kinds of um, these kinds of discussions. Uh, the focus on return and something that can be measured versus what actually through investments can destroy or harm a community is something else. I don't know how we take account of that. The other, the other concept too, uh, that uh, like the, the committee or ultimately when it, when it is um, uh, sent back to the committee, um, is the concept of it. there's a short-term benefit and then there's a long-term benefit. And there could be, depending on the, the payout and the time it takes for investments to actually, I don't know what you would call it, mature or pay out or finalize or something like that, a final analysis. Um, they could be short-term, appear to, to be contributing in a positive way to the returns. And yet in the long-term may actually be negative. And again, that ties back to the timeline. And, um, but also the, then raises the concept of, should there be considered a way to perhaps get a return, a clawback of some of the benefits that have been paid if ultimately it is, it is identified that the particular investment did or I mean ultimately was not to the benefit of the of the system. I'm not advocating for it, but at least a concept of, of 
is this fair to the system or what is Cal is getting, you know, and what, what are the other stakeholders getting out of this uh, at least should be considered because all we're talking about is continuing to pay and pay and pay. We're doing it on certain measures and there may be people who don't accept those measures of benefit. Um, and I think in support of some of the other comments that have been said about the, the attractiveness of working for CalSTRS, it's not just a culture, but there are rea rea uh, realistic benefits to this, whether or not they're appreciated by an individual coming to CalSTRS is something else. But I'm assuming that uh, many of the investment um, personnel might be covered by civil service and civil service is a constitutional protection and has benefits that may or may not be appreciated by people. But one of those is it's not at will. And if in fact somebody, uh, you know, the, the issues about when or some, how to manage personnel in the context of civil service uh, present real um, uh, different issues than what a person is in uh, those similar types of things in the private sector of at will employment. And those at, for employees at times provide benefits that are not provided in those, um, in, in those uh, outside positions. And I think they should be factored in as well, in some way, right, factored in, should be considered. The benefits of that, all benefits of being employed by the state should be considered. Uh, as part of this thing, and at least contemplated and could be rejected. But um, uh, I think CalSTRS operates in the context of, a, of the civil service system and state agency system, and um, that is a reality. So uh, Thanks, that's it. Thank you, sir. Uh, I think there's, I'd like to just get to one of the questions that are wins inside of that and get your feedback, Luis, is, the issue of clawbacks and how you and um, firms like yours that advise boards like ours on compensation think about clawbacks. Yeah, so you know we went through that as part of the discussion back in September, if you recall. So you know the current policy, you know, does allow for the normal type of, of clawbacks for under you know fraud or misrepresentation, et cetera. Um, so you know, Kelsey's is well protected uh, under that. Um, you know, so I, I feel good about that already in terms of being in place. Okay, thanks, Luis. I don't see any additional hands. Uh, in our note to you, we mentioned that we thought we might go 45 minutes. We're at 40 minutes, uh, so that was good planning. Just a quick overview. I, I sense um, a broad support uh, by the committee, by the board, broad support by the board for the LTIP, including the four year period uh, linked to the cost savings through the collaborative model. Um, see it as an attraction, retention issues, as well as uh, the um, direct link to the total fund performance over that time period, which I think is terrific. Um, really appreciate it many of your questions because I have quite a few myself and appreciate the clarity around um, if an employee leaves and the difference between leaving voluntarily and, and all of that will come back in, in that document you spoke about, Luis. Um, certainly more of the details will have to be flushed out, um, but uh, I don't think we need to let the perfect be the enemy of the good. So the next uh, time we will see this item in greater detail uh, and clarity will be in May. And Melissa, maybe you can close it out by telling us what the next step is on, in this process. And Luis, thanks for the presentation, the slides and the clarity. My pleasure. Sure, so um, we do have the labor market study that's being conducted in May um, with McLaughlin and Luis will be present to support that um, review. That will inform us on um, the LTIP component and further discussions will take place with Luis on planning uh, an update to the full board on next steps relative to the LTIP framework. 
Um, I suspect that will return in July um, with some of the details uh, mapped out. It'll take uh, myself and Louise time to also partner with Scott and Chris, uh, April and Shafat in investments to also go over um, the cost savings uh, calculation and um, kind of noodle that a little bit more. So next steps, we will be back in May to um, go over the labor market study. Thanks, Melissa. And I know Scott and uh, Chris referenced the independent verification of the calculations. That is very important to me that the, and I'm sure the full board, not only of the savings in the, the, um, the, the LTIP, I mean, excuse me, the savings in the collaborative model, that they're independently verified, reasonably calculated, et cetera. But also if and when we do have the LTIP in place that those awards are independently calculated and verified uh, for us. So thank you very much, Luis. Thank you, Melissa, for your continued work on this. Harry? Thank you. Harry. Hi, Karen. Yeah, go ahead, Karen. I just have a quick question on when the clock starts because in, on slide five, there's a reference to it beginning year one, beginning 2021, which is this year, which, which would be July 1, correct? Correct. So we will have all the, um, the rules and the game plan all in place then for, for employees to be able to track. Is that assuming, correct? Uh, assuming we have the support of the board. Uh, right. Yes, yes. So assuming everything goes as planned, then year one, July 1, 2021, is when the clock starts for the four years. Correct. OK. And we're going to have enough time to do that between now and July 1? It's always tight. <laughs> <laughs> okay, just ask. We, we always right. we always seem we always seem to get there. So okay. Can Thank I you, just Mr. Ask, Chair. Thank you. Karen, because I think you're asking, I think it was helpful when Melissa was talking about the May meeting and then July. And so I right. think when you talk about the July meeting, that is obviously after July 1st. So maybe you could just help clarify or be a little more specific around action, action from the board. Because I think that's what you're getting at, Karen, right? Like right. So Melissa right. could help add a little Go forward with that. Yes, thank you. Yeah. Well, I'm hoping that we can bring um, back something a little bit, well, more fully baked in July um, to present to the board. And I, I believe Brian's here as well. And, you know, it always comes up with the timing and, and proper noticing to those that are eligible, um, that would be eligible for the long, t uh, the long term incentive. And so, um, Brian, can, can you speak to that? Because I know we've had previous discussions about um, noticing and also those items that come kind of after the performance period has already begun. Yeah, unfortunately, it's a question of it depends what the change is. You know, it's the same sort of you have a, a vested right to a, a pension and somebody coming along after you started performing under that, that promise and changes it. So if you remember the last change we made, we, uh, we had a legal opinion that said it was really a ministerial change and not a substantive change. So again, it really does depend upon if there are any changes that are substantive and affect folks who are after July 1st performing under the original terms and conditions. So as Lee said, it's always a struggle towards the end trying to get these things you know, done and word out. Sometimes we can get the word out um, you know, through a prior meeting, at least what you're thinking about, put people on notice. Um, so it's a delicate dance. I mean, we'll do what we can to support the effort uh, you know, and get whatever um, legal advice that we need to, to, um, to move it forward. But it's a, it's a good question. We really won't know until we look at the changes. Thanks, Brian. So yeah, Luis and uh, Melissa will be very busy on the next couple of months and we'll be on a tight timeline. Uh, I'm optimistic that uh, you know, an enhancement in someone's pay won't re result in uh, any you know, adverse legal action. It's usually when there's, you know, a board is taking action to reduce someone's compensation. It gets a little sensitive, but uh, you might be getting a long-term incentive pay paid out. Uh, should, people should probably be understanding of that. We'll work through it. Really great questions and conversations today. Broad consensus for the 
for the idea. And uh, thanks again to everyone for your participation. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. It brings us to item four, the pension solution project, a re regular oversight report. I'm going to turn it to Prashant. Uh, Prashant, uh, as you come on screen here, a heartfelt thank you on behalf of the board to you and your team. Uh, you, you and the team that are overseeing this project, this is a um, material project to the organization that under ordinary times would be extremely stressful. There's a lot of capital involved. There's a lot at stake that directly impact our members in the payment of their benefit. A really comprehensive and complicated project that the board has oversight on, but you and the team are building out and doing. And you're doing it during an extremely stressful time. So on behalf of the board, please communicate to your entire team how much we appreciate all that they're doing and recognize uh, that they're doing it during an, a very, very difficult period. So thank you for your efforts and your team's effort. With that, I'll turn it over to you and Cassandra. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Appreciate it. Good morning, uh, members of the board. I appreciate the opportunity to provide an update for the pension solution project. I hope you had a chance to review the detailed report, so I will keep my update brief so we can have more time in the end for any discussion. And I'm also joined by uh, Graham Finley from Independent Project Oversight, along with Dave Delgado from CGI Executive Leadership Team. Pension Solution Project Team continues to operate 100% remote environment since the pandemic started last year uh, and is making forward progress while navigating through the challenges that I will discuss in the next couple of minutes. Testing, data conversion, training, and employee readiness remains our key focus areas. Employee readiness team is on track to complete 100% of their readiness visits by the end of this month. Starting next month, the employee readiness team will begin initiating a final file validation series with employers to make sure they are able to complete their testing with a new system. So amazing progress on that front. Data conversion team continues to make great progress. Both Calistros and CGI teams are working hard to ensure the data quality improves over time. The learning and development team, also called training team, continues to collaborate with the business areas for the development of training material for the function rollout tool to ensure organization training needs are met. Change management is another important area where we continue to make great progress. An organization-wide pension solution change readiness assessment was done recently to understand how ready the organization is to adopt to the new pension system. And I'm happy to report that the results are very encouraging. It's clear that we are moving in the right direction. We have also gathered feedback that will be useful for making further adjustments and improvement as we progress further in the journey. Now, with respect to testing effort, CGI continues to experience significant delays to complete various test efforts. And Calisters continues to make progress on the user acceptance testing, also called UAT, but at a somewhat slower pace than planned due to higher number of PIRs, also called problem incident reports. The higher number of PIRs essentially create more work for Calisters in terms of retesting and making sure those get cleared. So far, UAT team has executed about 2,100 test cases out of total 6,800, and about 1,400 of them have already passed. Testing will remain our main focus area in the coming months. But despite these delays and challenges, we remain confident that the project will find ways to overcome these. For the function rollout, Three, the schedule continues to be impacted by the cascading effect from the function rollout to testing delays. We expect to get this addressed when CGI is able to provide a new viable plan to complete the remaining project activities. In the end, I would like to um, highlight two of the challenges, two of the key challenges we are faced with. The first one is around testing challenge that I touched upon briefly earlier. 
that CGI continues to experience delays in completing various test activities, and our initial pass rate in the UAT is somewhat slower, lower than expected. Both calisters and oversight vendors have asked CGI to provide a root cause analysis uh, to those repeated delays. In addition, calisters expect CGI to provide a revised project schedule that is quality focused, realistic, and achievable for the remaining function rollout two and three activities. I would say at this point of time, we know that this challenge will certainly lead to schedule adjustments and will impact the goal I date. However, the extent of impact is not known and we will have a better idea once CGR is able to complete their analysis and provide the detailed information to calisters and oversight for our review. The second challenge I would like to highlight is around COVID pandemic. Uh, as I said before, uh, it has been almost one year since the pandemic started and we shifted our entire workforce for the 100% remote operations. Training and user acceptance testing were the two largest efforts involving a large amount of staff from Calisters. And those efforts involve the high degree of interaction and collaboration across multiple teams. As you can imagine, the training and testing are, are not cannot happen in silos. It happens uh, with a large amount of interaction and collaboration. Both the activities had to be replanned from in-person to virtual environment given the pandemic situation. But kudos to both the teams, Calistros and CGI, who have adopted and made it work as best as possible. But it is extremely difficult to simulate or uh, the in-person experience with a Zoom-based virtual interaction, especially when multiple teams across multiple business areas are involved uh, in the support of the, those efforts. The project has over 350 participants. Some are in full-time, some others are in part-time capacity. And the Zoom fatigue is certainly a growing concern for us. In the end, I do want to acknowledge both the teams, Calistro and CGI, for their passion and hard work as they continue to find balance between their personal and work life while being 100% remote. That's all I had as far as prepared a bit goes, Mr. Chair. I'm happy to take any question uh, or if there are any questions for Graham from our side or Dave from CGI. Thank you. Thank you, Prashant. Questions, Controller Yi. Thank you, Harry, and uh, thank you for um, really appreciate these regular updates and uh, definitely want to add my uh, my thanks to um, all the parties for the extra, you know, just the extra attention to this project, obviously, under some extraordinary circumstances. Um, and, and I think, Prashant, you um, touched on the question that uh, we don't know the answer to yet. That is whether these delays will extend the go live date beyond the September 2022 date. So still to be determined is what I'm understanding is. Correct. Uh, uh, yes, uh, most likely, I mean, at this point of time, we feel that there is certainly a schedule impact, but the extent of impact is not known. I think we are waiting for CGI to provide the details before we can be certain about it. Okay. All right. And then I do want to hear from CGI in a moment. Um, and, and I guess what I wanted to get a flavor of is, um, are the issues that are being identified through the testing, uh, are they systemic to the extent that it may, um, I guess, question our confidence about what the end system will be able to provide in terms of capabilities? I mean, are we at that level of concern or are we um, still okay with respect to you know, what the system will offer? Uh, so uh, I would say that that's a great question. And, and we have asked CGI to provide a detailed root cause analysis. And the purpose of that analysis is to understand that if those issues are, are uh, systematic issues or, or these issues are, are because of other reasons. So CGI, we are expecting CGI to provide that analysis or that report to us in the next couple of weeks. And that will reveal better details as to what, what is the reason of these delays, what, why we are experiencing this situation that we are experiencing. Okay. Um, again, um, I appreciate that all parties are continuing to prioritize um, quality over the schedule, but uh, 
Um, I guess I just want to keep these questions kind of front and center as we're continuing to experience these challenges. And I see Mr. Delgado and his team on, but uh, any comments, Mr. Delgado? Yes, I mean, from an executive point of view, and we do have Megan Panson on, who is uh, a local Sacramento resource that we have assigned to the project, and she can also speak. But I do want to answer uh, the question you posed just now. We do not see systemic issues. Um, so as we look at the defects that come through that are found through our testing process, we are seeing things that can be fixed. So we're not seeing things that are either, uh, you know, something that looks difficult or beyond what we're able to deal with. So far, everything that's coming through, uh, through collaboration and working together to fine tune and vet these issues, we see resolution. So we're confident in that matter. We also know that T certain test reports show a higher pass rate than others, and that's because the more specific we get about what is not failing, then the, the more we see that actually a lot is passing, but it's not completing to 100%. So the entire thing in a, in a case study, for example, or mm -hmm. a test case would fail. So I think those are good ways to manage and monitor the way that we're working through the system and through the test process so that we're transparent with everything and we can see uh, a lot more detail. We are expecting to give our first report on uh, CAT testing delays and improvements to UAT testing next week to the team. And at this point, it, it's all, it's a commingled team and we have to work that way. I will say it is challenging and this is one thing that we're seeing across the board on all of our projects globally, that doing them through Zoom and Teams and different types of things like that are great and helpful, but you do lose uh, an ability to closely work together to figure things out as, as we would normally do it in uh, resolution rooms and, and things like that where we're together and we can work right there, pass paper between us and do things like that. So a little bit limited there and a little bit challenging for all of us to work through those types of things, but we are doing it. Uh, I appreciate Prashant saying that, that he believes, and as do we, that we will find a way to move forward. Uh, again, we want a system that works for CalSTRS and we see that on the horizon. The problem is that it is taking us longer to get to that point. So that's what we're trying to resolve. We want to find ways to improve this process without sacrificing quality and making certain that everybody comes along with us through this process now. We've, it's been a long journey. <laughs> We've been yeah. for, for years, but we're on the home stretch and the testing activities are critical as we move through this and we Testing needs to show failures and passes. The failures need to be resolved. We retest and we move on. Unfortunately, this is taking longer than any one of us expected. So we want to work through that process. Uh, I appreciate that, Mr. Delgado. Uh, Harry, if you don't mind, uh, I just wanted to pose a question to Megan as a follow-up. You, you have the floor control. Uh, Okay. Um, so Megan, as you look at this, so uh, if the defects that are being identified are not systemic, uh, how would you characterize them? Um, just uh, to give us a little bit more of a flavor of what we're, what we're dealing with, given the, the, I guess, the numbers of them. So. Right. So part of our root cause analysis, the great thing is none of them are systemic, as Dave said, yeah. and um, we're finding different categories of uh, defects from um, possible, you know, changes on screen, things that can't be accomplished um, as expected. Sometimes um, scripts are um, filled out test scripts, right? The steps that you go through, um, the business user might expect one result and they get a different result. So that would open up a PIR. Dave alluded to some of the metrics and the identifying more of a granularity in our metrics. 
And so we're actually working with CalSTRS, even though these uh, recommendations are coming out, we're already working with CalSTRS together, IBMD, IPOC, uh, both teams, to come up with how do we manage these metrics better? Because sneak peek into the report, we're seeing better um, pass rates than and less number of PIRs if we categorize them correctly. We're already modifying our triage process of PIRs. So we catch those things that went in that might've been false positives. Okay. So, um, you know, those are some of the things that we're seeing. Okay, that's helpful. Thank you. Thanks, Harry. Thank you, Betty. Gail? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I have the same question as the controller. Um, but just a, a little bit more granular, and you're welcome to provide this in writing to CGI, just because, you know, we've had these substandard pass rates for the user acceptance test, and I'm sort of unclear, and then we immediately went into the contractor acceptance test, and like how those two, the substandard pa pass rates sort of, what, maybe it just can't be this linear, but it just seems to be compounding rather than being resolving, so you're welcome to answer that in writing if that's easier, but I'm, I'm curious to know that. And then just the second question, um, hearing the piece about timing, remain concerned about that. Also really concerned now about budget. So just um, if we could answer, I don't know if the budget question is better to our Calsters team, but if the CGI team could at least answer sort of the, the sequencing and the cadence of, of the contractor acceptance test and then the user acceptance test kind of both coming together with these substandard rates. Yeah, we can get back to you on that, um, but it definitely, there was compounded because you're asking resources to kind of split their time or double up their time on doing um, the projects in, in conjunction or the uh, efforts in conjunction. So we will get information back to you on that. Right, and, yeah, a little bit concerned about that. Before you yeah. jump in, I just wanted to maybe put a little point on Gail's question. I'm sure others have thought the same. From the beginning of this project, quality has been you know, our, our, our number one priority and remains that. We also know the complexity of the project and certainly take into consideration all that Mr. Delgado has said in terms of trying to do this all remotely. Um, this project at the end of the day directly touches our members. So we've got to get it right. We have to get it at 100% you know, when we go live. Uh, there's such a ripple effect for less than 100%. So if it takes us longer to get down the field and punch the ball into the end zone, so be it. But we're also a fiscally responsible organization and we have limitations. So everyone has to be sensitive to that. I know you are, but on behalf of the board, I wanted to make that point. But we are a fiscally responsible organization and are very sensitive to budget. Back to, back to you, Gail. And Cassandra, I don't know if you wanted to jump in there. Yeah, I, I appreciate the question, Gail. That is one of the things that we will be um, discussing with CGI. And if, and if uh, the timing um, does uh, have a cost impact, we will definitely be negotiating that we, with CGI. It doesn't necessarily mean it will cost our organization more money than we have already budgeted for the project. We are still dedicated to, to bring it in um, at at the budget that we have set. So that will take some negotiations. We have been working diligently and trying to um, uh, accomplish cost savings where we can. I think we have done um, a very good job with the team doing that. And so some of the conversations we can continue to have as we learn more about it, but um, that's where our focus is. Thanks, Gail. I don't see any other hands. Uh, anything else for the good of the order, anything from CGI or Cassandra, Prashant, or Graham Finley, anyone else need to weigh in before we, we move the item? Okay, seeing none, thanks everyone for being here and your continued work on this uh, mission critical project. Thank you so much. Thank you. That brings us to our next item, item five is the Enterprise Risk Management Report. We have. Uh, Julie Underwood, our Chief Financial Officer, and Philip Burkholder, uh, who works directly with Julie. I'll turn it over to you, Julie. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Members of the board, I am Julie Underwood. I am the Chief Financial Officer, and I am here with Phil Burkholder, and he is our Enterprise Risk Program Manager. 
and we are presenting the semi-annual enterprise risk management report as of December 31st, 2020. Now, previously we provided you these semi-annual reports at the May and November board meetings. During the same meetings as we provide you the actuarial valuation and the funding risk report. But after considering how we can address a board comment to provide more regular actuarial risk updates to you, we've adjusted our reporting periods to end at the calendar and fiscal year end so that this will allow us to provide you these reports in March and September, which will now be off cycle from the actuarial valuation presented in May and the funding risk report presented in November. So this is one way we can provide you with actuarial risk reporting on a more regular basis instead of at just the two meetings a year. So we hope that this change assists with that concern. Now, I also wanted to mention two accomplishments for this period. The branch risk assessment template has been updated to include branch level fraud risks so that the mitigations identified also consider fraud. And the Office of General Counsel has been identified as the global owner of our new risk category 11 for third parties. So thank you to General Counsel Brian Bartow for leading this effort. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Phil to present the highlights of the report. Phil? Phil, you're on mute. I heard that, that famous line a couple of times in the last couple of days. <laughs> uh, good morning. As Julie said, my name is Philip Burkholder, your ERM manager. This report contains a narrative that describes and summarizes the two attachments. Uh, attachment one is a heat map, which is a high level depiction of CalSTRS current inherent and residual enterprise risk landscape. And attachment two is a risk score report. And that's a more detailed view of the inherent risk and residual risk scores for each of the risk categories and their associated sub-risks. Uh, this morning, I'd like to focus our discussion on the heat map and specifically on the risk categories that changed over the reporting period. Uh, as a reminder, the heat map shows two risk ratings for each category, an inherent risk score or the risk without the benefit of mitigations and the residual score, which is the risk that is left after our mitigation efforts. So before we go too far, though, I wanted to point out uh, an error that was on the board item itself. On page six, the graphic for risk category six, pension reform, has an arrow going the wrong way. It should be a downward arrow, not an upward arrow. Now, the, the text in the item itself for this risk category and for the risk category, uh, the risk report is also cor is correct in both cases. The arrow just simply got reversed. Um, so. Overall, uh, there were four risk rating, four higher rated risk categories and four risk categories that shifted over this period. We're gonna focus on the four that, was, that shifted over this period. The risk categories that where the ratings didn't change have been reviewed by staff who determined a risk change was not necessary at this time. Uh, additional details on all of these risk categories are included in the narrative of the board item. So I wanna shift our attention to the to the heat map, which again is attachment one of item five. And we're gonna work our way across that, that document. So the first uh, category I'd like to focus on is category two, pension funding actuarial. Overall, we felt a risk rating increase was necessary to reflect the underlying changes and trends that have occurred since the board last adopted its actuarial assumptions in January of 2020. This risk rating increase is really focused on the inflation assumption and the current experience and forecast that show inflation continuing to be below our assumptions. As discussed on page four, inflation is a key component of two other key economic assumptions, expected payroll growth and the assumed rate of return. Actuarial staff will continue to watch these assumptions closely as part of their ongoing review of the funding plan. And we'll next report on this trend in May when they present the various annual actuarial evaluation reports. Looking to our right, our, the, our next category that shifted was, was number five, financial reporting. This category's inherent risk remains stable, but the residual risk shift, shifted two points upward to recognize the increasing complexity associated with the properly reflecting the fair value of new investment types in our financial statements. As you know, Crow identified a significant deficiency in this area during their last audit. Continuing to our right, risk category six, 
the residual score for pension reform shifted down four points to reflect the reduced risk now that the current challenges to the California rule have been addressed by the, cor the court's ruling in the Alameda County case. Staff continue to closely monitor other court cases for any potential impact to, invest, to vested rights. Moving all the way over to risk category 10, transformational change. There was a one point shift upwards in inherent risk and a two point shift upwards for residual risk. Now these shifts are, the, are really to reflect the challenges you just heard about in the pension solution update provided in item four of today's meeting. As we move forward, we will continue to closely monitor this risk category to ensure we are recognizing the changes to the risk profile. Um, as the pension solution project is a key mitigation to risk category four, pension administration, staff considered a risk rating change to that risk category too, but felt any change would, need it, would not be needed unless the project experienced a significant delay. Staff will readdress this after CGI completes its root cause analysis. So I, I wanna move back to uh, the operational risk category number eight. This is our single largest risk category in terms of the number of sub risks. And while it's low, rated in the low risk level and it didn't have an overall rating shift, it is right on the verge of the medium risk level and it did have rating changes at the sub risk level. For, for these reasons, we wanted to, to share kind of what those changes are. And there were two of them. The first change was that we added a sub risk to recognize the risk that the CalSTRS not completing the headquarters expansion project with an established scope, schedule, or budget due to delays with construction. Specifically, as we continue to, to be challenged to acquire the necessary permits, this risk may become an issue for the project to meet its goals. The second change in, in this category was uh, we lowered the risk score for the pandemic-related sub-risk due to the organization's effectiveness of, of, of mitigating its, its risk here. Coincidentally, these changes offset, so there wasn't a total risk score change for operations risk category on the heat map. Overall, staff continue to monitor organizational progress on the strategic plan initiatives, any budget constraints, and the overall effect of events on the strategic goals. In our opinion, the enterprise level risks continue to be adequately managed and mitigated. The organization continues to fare well during the pandemic due to the mitigation plans it already had in place or developed after the onset of the crisis. And with that, if, if you have any questions, we'll be happy to answer them. Thanks, Mr. Burke Holder, and thank you, Julie. Great report, really tremendous graphics and um, very clear, comprehensive report on risks. Uh, Bill, let's go to you first. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Julie and staff, thank you very much for this report. It's very uh, enlightening. As you know, uh, I'm sort of focused on the funding plan and where we stand and the risks that uh, are inherent uh, to uh, uh, not only our members, uh, but uh, to uh, us complying with the uh, 2014 legislation funding plan. And I guess I have a couple of questions uh, relating to that. One is that uh, that we have, uh, the governor has indicated that there is going to be a supplemental payment of about $583 million uh, to the fund to keep the funding plan on track. And, and that's part of his budget, as I understand it. And, and are we tracking that and, and where we are on that particular item? Good morning. I mean, oh, oh. Oh, ah, David, David, you're there, my man. I was there. I'm always there and listening, ready to jump in as needed. So good morning, everyone. Uh, I wasn't sure if you want to say something to me, otherwise I'll answer Bill's question. Go ahead. I'll go. Uh, yeah, no, we are monitoring yet the bill. We actually had also several discussions with the administration leading to their proposal. Uh, just to put it in perspective, part of the, the reason it was... Uh, labeled as keeping the funding plan uh, on track. I think part of the supplemental payment that the state is proposing is sort of to uh, handle um, one of the risks that we highlighted last November when we said that uh, when the state throws these, uh, the board rate setting authority for the state contribution rate, that there wasn't a catch up provision that it could increase the risk to the funding plan. So part of that supplemental payment is to make up that missing half a percent that we would have next year. 
So we are monitoring all of this. And on top of that, they're provide the state is proposing an additional $410 million above what we would need to just keep the funding plan on track. So this is great news for our funding plan. Uh, and yeah. and can, I, can I just add, it does show the state's yeah. commitment to eliminate its share of unfunded liability and we really appreciate the state's support. And, and of course that has to be uh, adopted by the legislature uh, and, and we're sort of monitoring that I assume. Yes. Yeah, okay. And uh, uh, David, while you're on the line, uh, maybe you could comment on uh, uh, employers' contributions, where we are, the retirements over the last uh, three months or so, uh, et, et cetera, and how that might be the trending. So on the, on the first part for the employer contribution, just to remind everyone, uh, as part of the uh, budget that was passed by, by the state last July, some uh, uh, temporary rate relief was, providing to, uh, was provided to employers. So both this year and next year, employers will be paying about 16% of payroll, almost two to 3% less than was originally intended by the funding plan. So those contributions are, so are gonna stay around that level for the next two years. But already uh, we heard at one of the budget hearing earlier this month, already there were some discussions about whether or not uh, additional rate relief should be provided to employers beyond 21, 22. Uh, no actions taken yet, but you can see some of those discussions have started already. And when it comes to retirement rates, uh, I think uh, we had a question related to this at the January board meeting. Uh, all I'll say is when it comes to retirements, it doesn't necessarily impact our funding because you've got to keep in mind that when someone retires, most of the, the, normally the money that's needed to fund the retirement benefits is already in the fund. What we're really watching is whether it will have implications on, uh, I would say the number of teachers uh, actively working in California. So what we don't know is what decisions a school district will make following someone's retirement. Because we start to see a slight decline in the number of teachers last year. Now the question is, will this lead to you know, less teachers being replaced, especially now we hear about lower enrollment into schools. So I don't know, so, so we're watching. Uh, right now there's nothing to be alarmed, but it's something that we'll watch and we will report back. The next time we'll be able to report back on this will be in November because we'll be able to see kind of in the summer, like how many teachers now do we have again in California? So we'll, we'll, re we we'll report back on this uh, through our regular monitoring process, uh, most likely in November as part of our risk report. And, and just one more question, David, uh, and thank you for uh, in, your enlightenment on all of this. Um, as I understand it, you, you mentioned that there may be further employer relief uh, being considered. Would that impact, as I understand it, we will be setting, uh, this board will be setting the employer contribution rate how would that impact uh, uh, us uh, making those decisions? So even if you look at next year, uh, your ability to set the rate was not uh, affected by the, by the budget last year. What the budget did is it basically provided a rate relief uh, based on the rate set by the board. So if you look at the current statute in California, the way it, it is written for next year, it says that the employers will pay 2.18% less than the rate set by the board. So that's how it was done. So uh, uh, I guess it's just a guess, but we could probably assume that if further relief is provided in the future, that it probably will come in that form. Okay. So the rate setting authority was not uh, impacted. It's just that the state gave us money on behalf of the employers, and that sum of money was equivalent to about 2.2%. So that's the reduction. The right. And what we've heard so far is potentially a, a, a similar idea being proposed. What if the state gave money to Calisters to provide rate relief to the employers? Great. Again, thank you so much for your uh, help on this issue. Thanks. You're welcome. Thanks, Bill. Any other questions? Okay. Seeing none. Thank you, Julie. Thank you, Philip. David, thanks for jumping on. Thank you. Great. Let's go to the next item. Um, 
This is the annual GRI sustainability report, and we're going to hear both from Jack and Cassandra on this uh, this report. I think it's the seventh or eighth annual GRI report, and uh, we turn it over to am I turning it over to Jack or Cassandra? I'm going to start out, and then I'm going to turn it over to Cassandra to actually get in the details a bit of our what we're doing here. And this is an exciting item. So I just want to lay the groundwork for you on this. Um, you know, for years at CalSTRS, we've discussed with you sustainability, sometimes at the enterprise level, sometimes in the investment branch through their efforts. And I have to, it's sometimes hard to know when are we at a tipping point in a discussion around um, a difficult topic like this around the world. And I think I can confidently tell you, we are at a tipping point in this discussion. I just wanna read you the headlines just in the past days around sustainability and ESG around the world. We've had a governor in the US Federal Reserve System say, that she will now support mandatory disclosure of climate risks in the United States from the Federal Reserve. Never have we had that voice. We've had the acting chair of the SEC, the incoming chair of the SEC, and then just this week, the staff and Corp Finn announced that they will have an enforcement task force around the disclosures of climate risk for US corporations. We've had the International Financial Reporting Standards Board in London setting global financial reporting standards announce that they will now entertain looking at developing sustainability standards. We've had the International Organization of State Regulators, uh, of Country Regulators, Security Exchange Regulators, IOSCO, announced that they now support some sustainability standards. And then probably the most forward thinking and the most uh, quick, quickly moving is the European Union. Through what they call EFRAG, they are well along the path to announcing how they are going to require mandatory reporting in Europe probably beginning in 2023 and 24. So I just wanna make sure we all understand this is no longer a theoretical discussion. It's more about how we're gonna do this and it is moving very fast. And the good part for us here together is that through our various leadership roles, through the enterprise and investments, um, we're part of these conversations. We're part of helping shape what this will look like for corporate reporting, as well as from an investor standpoint. So I'm gonna show you just a couple slides to get you in the framework of this. And I, and I think finally, we're at the point at CalSTRS where we need to probably not be separating this conversation between what we do in the investment committee and talking about some of those initiatives and then the enterprise. And I wanna show you a lens that people are using now for talking about this, which we've never really explored together. So let me do that. And then I'll turn this over to Cassandra to really talk about this year's report. So uh, Jonathan, if you'd move the slides, this is just quickly, this is the um, level of reporting among the major corporations across all countries in the world. And again, if you go to a website of any progressive corporation, you will find a tab that says, what is their sustainability report? And most likely it's going to follow the format that we're using at CalSTRS called GRI, Global Reporting Standard Initiative. Uh, next slide. Jonathan, you'd move it. And this, these are just all the various stock exchanges. You know, sometimes we get fixated on the New York and London and NASDAQ, but there's stock exchanges throughout the world. And some of them have been more advanced like South Africa um, that have really drilled down, have listing standards now around sustainability. So it's an incredible conversation, even among the stock exchanges. Uh, next slide, gentlemen. And then um, this is the only acronyms I'm gonna burden you with today, but I wanted to make sure you know kind of who are the players in this conversation and where's CalSTRS fit into these players? Well, again, the oldest standards and um, talk about irony. I don't know if you all know how GRI started, but it actually started with the Exxon Valdez. 
it's, it's kind of ironic in, in light of all the other things we're talking about. But with that environmental disaster came a social movement that we needed to have corporate transparency around environmental disclosures. And that was pioneered by Ceres, the organization that we partner with in so many efforts at CalSTRS. Ceres spawned these standards initially way back now, 23 years ago. And then after a period of time, Ceres decided they were not really a standard setting organization. And they, if you will, jettisoned GRI to Amsterdam to become a global reporting system that again, the majority of corporations are now using for their reporting. And then within the last decade, SASB came to existence with a bit of a narrower focus around material interests of financial interests, if you will, to investors. And that was, of course, born in San Francisco. We were on the initial board and Sheehan was part of that board. I am part of that board. And uh, we also have Verity that works on our investment branch. She actually is vice chair of the standards board. So we're very active on the SASB side. And Chris was the chair of the investor advisory group for several years. And then we have these other organizations. Just the only comment I'm going to leave you with, there are backroom conversations going on right now between all five of these organizations. Everybody can sense the momentum that is happening and I mean, not looking out two years, looking out weeks, there is so much going on in these conversations. So you can expect to see more changes, more desire for um, bringing together some common framework to thinking about this. And then the last slide, the next one, Jonathan, if you'd move to is this, and I, no, not go, go back one, this. So this is what I wanted to kind of leave you with today. Is this, this new word that we're all using in sustainability reporting called dynamic materiality. It's, I know it has a tone of jargon to it, but take a look at this for a minute. And I'll, maybe I'll give you a, a, a corporate example of how this plays out. But in that interior circle there, the, the smallest one is financial reporting. And of course, in the United States, that is guided by FASB for, private, for public or private corporations, GASB for governmental entities, but that is all the traditional financial reporting of materiality that we expect to see for um, transparency of business. Beyond, go to the outer ring now. That is the reporting that we're talking about today. That is the broad sustainability reporting that impacts the economy, the environment, people. So it's the impact of a business on all those things. And then within that is another layer, if you will, of sustainability reporting. And that's a little more narrowly focused around enterprise value creation, the, the issues that are most of interest to an investor. So all three of these layers, if you will, of materiality are relevant to a corporation's or business success and what needs to be reported. And we're trying to figure out now, how do we develop straightforward, sensible, doable, if you will, standards that are not burdensome, unnecessarily burdensome, but tell the right messages to the public, to NGOs, to stakeholders, et cetera, in what we do. And, may, and what we need to think about is issues that a company confronts may go back and forth, up and down this continuum. And I'll give you one example for those of, well, this is for those of us that are older, not everyone will remember this, but, the, the issue of asbestos in the United States and the companies that were manufacturing products involving asbestos, when that started as an issue, it was a health issue in this country. It was a health issue for the workers that installed that asbestos in, in your ceiling or in your walls. It was a health issue for people that used products that had asbestos. And that was, of, of course, great concern to people. Uh, its impact. Ultimately, that product was so damaging to people, environment, et cetera, um, that it became threatening to the major company in the United States out of Denver that made asbestos, ultimately bankrupting that company. So that transformed itself over a number of years from a clearly external healthcare issue into something that have considerable financial risk and ultimately brought bankruptcy um, to that company. So, 
we've got to figure out here in these coming weeks how we will develop a sensible, comprehensive system of reporting. So those five entities I mentioned, the regulators around the world, that is what is going on right now, is bringing this together into some mandatory reporting system that has assurance, just like we require assurance on any financial statement, we don't currently require assurance around sustainability reporting. So I, I would just wanna give you that glimpse, if you will, of, of, of the next 12 months and what that conversation that will be here in the United States, certainly in Brussels, they will be in the lead seat and also in London. So with that, uh, Jonathan, you can go to the next slide. And uh, we'll just, this is our framework that we use for our report. And uh, Rhonda Lency is our lead person that um, develops this report with us, but she's got a team uh, in our organization throughout that really has to bring this information together. And Lisa Williams uh, was, I wanted to call out as well, because she was the graphic artist that worked on this report. And I, and I think you can tell by looking at the graphics, we really felt this was a year we needed to deliver a different message here to the audience. Um, too many of these sustainability reports are kind of happy pictures of solar panels and wind turbines and all those things and forests and trees and all those things. Um, but the reality is we're not where we need to be as a country or a world meeting the goals of the Paris Agreement. Um, there are some daunting challenges before us and they also, and they're not all environmental. Uh, many of them result, revolve around human capital issues. So um, hopefully that uh, resonated with you when you saw the, uh, the, the, the emotion we wanted to evoke in this report. So let me let uh, now Cassandra really delve into this with you and talk about uh, what we're doing this year. I'll, uh, I'll take my video off here, Cassandra, and you take right. over. Jonathan, you can go on to the next slide. So this is our suite of reports that are united under the umbrella of global stewardship at work and includes the long-term value creation and disclosure and transparency reporting that we conduct. The sustainability report includes general disclosures about the organization and uses stakeholder input that we gather through a number of uh, mechanisms to identify key topics or matters of significance regarding economic, environmental, and social matters that we're interested in. The comprehensive annual financial report is the report of our basic financial statement with the popular annual financial report designed for readers without a background in uh, public finance. And if you remember, we just uh, presented the financial statements to the board um, in the November meeting. The Green Initiative Task Force features low carbon, the low carbon transition work plan activities and enhanced stewardship activities. And this, uh, a task force plan is being updated um, for this next year. Go, go ahead and go to the next slide, please. So corporate sustainability <laughs> requires balancing consistency with predicting and reacting to unexpected shifts. And CalSTRS corporate sustainability program was launched in 2013 where we formally established this corporate sustainability program with dedicated resources in the executive branch. And as we're looking at the slide, I wanted to note that the timeline represents our enterprise-wide approach to organizational sustainability. It doesn't call out the investment branch's specific history or work plan, which is very robust. But one of our goals is to really try to incorporate those two um, areas into a more global enterprise approach as we move forward in our sustain sustainability program as, as a whole. One of our initial actions uh, this year was to draft our sustainability vision and guiding beliefs and begin incorporating those concepts into the culture of CalSTRS through communication and, and education strategies. And then in 2015, we published our first sustainability report for the 2013-14 fiscal year in accordance with the GRI standards. And we also incorporated a perform to sustain component in our operations performance review reporting process and established metrics to measure how we perform. In 2016, we established the CalSTRS corporate sustainability advisory team that I chair, and it includes representation from all branches at the senior level. The team spans CalSTRS sustainability activities as well as the breadth of our stakeholder engagements. And then in 2017, we aligned our program to the series roadmap for sustainability, launching our corporate sustainability communication campaign in 2018. And, and 
2020 last year, we updated our pastor's sustainability gu uh, guiding beliefs again. Go ahead and go to the next slide. So here it is, it's a beautiful report. The 2019-20 sustainability report published this week is our seventh annual sustainability report, which is, it's amazing how fast time flies. It seems like we were really diving into this as a brand new adventure um, just, just yesterday, but seven years has gone by and we have really um, matured our process in developing this. And this year's report and topics reflect our approach to sustainability and our business continuity really during an extraordinary time. It includes an accounting of the pandemic's effects on our operations through June 30th, 2020. So if you think about it at the closing of this report, we had been under stay at home orders for just a little over three months. Many school districts and educators uh, had completed their school year using some sort of level of virtual platform. The financial markets had crashed and started a recovery. The federal government had issued the first economic stimulus package and then widespread protests against uh, social injustice and violence were really taking hold across the nation and the world, including here in Sacramento. And California, at the time of this report, hadn't even experienced the full effects of the massive 2020 wildfire season, which uh, ultimately burned more than 4 million acres. So we really haven't uh, seen the hadn't seen the effects of that, nor had we experienced the the rate of infections and the peak of the infection uh, and hospitalizations that we experienced in California. But with, the, with what we were experiencing at that time, three months into the pandemic, we updated our key topics to reflect our approach to corporate sustainability and business continuity, which was extraordinarily important um, in uh, transitioning and uh, trying to maintain our resiliency in the organization. The advisory team used information from surveys, executives, stakeholder engagement activities, and the impact of world events to determine the matters of significance establishing our key report topics. Go ahead and the next slide. So the five areas of significance begin with managing enterprise risk. Ongoing management of enterprise risk readied CalSTRS against the impacts of the pandemic. Our business continuity plans and te uh, technological uh, readiness, our information security practices, and a strong culture of ethics and integrity helped ensure core business functions continued throughout the report cycle. And with the additional risk mitigation uh, strategies in place, CalSTRS response to the COVID-19 was effective. CalSTRS risk pro profile has really remained stable. And then our path to full funding is another focal point in the report. In November of 2019, the board approved our long-term asset allocation targets, an important function of the board and key to achieving full funding. The report describes the cost savings from the collaborative model over the past two years. It notes the risk mitigating strategies asset class performed as expected during the sudden market drop in 2020. It also represents uh, or presents information about the pandemic's effect on California's budget and the effect on employer and state contribution rates and our continuous monitoring of the funding progress. The next focus um, is on member retirement preparedness. CalSTRS members are expected to live longer than the US average retiree and longer than uh, Cal CalPERS uh, members. As of June 30th, 2020, CalSTRS had 410 members that were over 100 years old. And, so, and that's a 13% increase over the prior year. So with longevity in mind, we help our members understand the, uh, the importance of supplemental savings and understand their primary defined benefit um, uh, retirement um, uh, component. The report also talks about our new onboarding toolkit and our remote services to members that we were able to execute during this remote work environment. The report also concentrates on the transition to a low carbon economy. It provides information on CalSTRS a uh, low carbon transition work plan, our investment belief nine that was adopted in January, January of 2020, our perspective on fossil fuel divestment and the value of engagements. And then finally, diversity, equity and inclusion play a fundamental role in CalSTRS culture, which are reflected in our core values. And in the report, we discuss our internal effort in response to the racial inequality and recent social events that affect all of us. It also includes our investments, longstanding activities to support diversity and inclusion in corporations and in the investment profession. Next slide. 
So other topics covered in the report include information on how we lead in the direction of sustainable finance. We model our commitment uh, to sustainable finance with the sale of the green bonds used to finance a headquarters expansion project. The series 2019 bonds were certified as meeting the robust climate bonds initiative standards. And we also feature our stewardship of natural resources through our headquarters environmental performance, including lead operations and maintenance platinum certification and an energy star rating of 98 out of 100. And finally, we discussed the janitorial infectious disease certification program used at headquarters to adapt cleaning and maintenance practices to rapidly evolve health and safety measures during this period of time where we had to uh, institute extraordinary cleaning measures um, to maintain the infectious diseases that we were um, experiencing. Next slide. So on the horizon, we have an opportunity to weave our corporate sustainability beliefs uh, and principles into the fabric of our upcoming strategic plan. So the executive team are currently working with Amy McDuffie, your board consultant, uh, in the coming months to elevate the sustainability and it integrated into the 2022 through 2025 strategic planning process. And we're really excited about um, working in a collaborative manner to, to complete those activities. That's it, thank you. Thank you. Cassandra, thank you, Jack. Um, thanks to the graphics team and everyone who put the report together. I certainly recognize the uh, changes with the graphics this year and have my favorite graphic that uh, some of you are aware which one that was. Uh, Sharon, I think there's a couple of hands, so we'll take the hands here, uh, Sharon and uh, then Bill. Hey. Thanks, Harry. Thanks, Cassandra and Jack and the whole team. That I know it's a lot of different people that touch this report, so appreciate the hard work and um, loved reading it. And um, I, I do just want to lend my support to this idea of integrating the concept of sustainability and the work that we're doing on the investment side and then kind of on the enterprise side. I, I really like how we're talking about that, Cassandra, moving forward, because I do think sometimes <clears throat> you know, those things get siloed a little bit. Um, and I think, you know, Jack's leadership as CEO and Chris's leadership as CIO um, in that realm, you know, bringing that together to me, is, it's more than the sum of its parts. So I think that movement and that integration is going to be important for us moving forward. So I just applaud that. I, I lend my support to you with the graphics with Harry, you know, we read a lot of stuff and you see a lot of graphics and I really appreciated that kind of innovation and, different approach to really try and capture in a more meaningful way versus just kind of a um, the more kind of mundane sort of way that sometimes these things get captured. So I appreciated the effort of that too. Um, my question was around, um, you know, communication and how I think we, we consistently talk about, you know, how do we tell our story better? How do we communicate what's happening inside the building and inside investments? Um, the activity that many of the board members, many of our staff are doing um, to try and influence the world in, in sort of thoughtful and, and strategic ways. Um, so I just wanted to know a little bit more about how do we anticipate or envision sharing this report uh, and telling kind of the stories within it in sort of like a, a more uh, proactive sort of way. So Cassandra, I don't know if you want to answer that. Certainly, you know, we we issued a press release at the beginning of this week, of course, and we do um, send it out to our stakeholders. We do do printed copies and we also share it um, throughout our stakeholder um, association memberships in cards with the QR codes so that we can make sure that they have access to all of the content and all of the various reports listed on the uh, one of the slides. Uh, we also, we do have a communication plan or strategy plan that we've adopted or have been working with in our uh, advisory team, but we're also, uh, uh, our communication strategy on a strategic level is also included in our strategic plan, and we're working on um, what those key components are as we're moving forward in the organization, and this is one of those key uh, communication components that we will be integrating into a broader context and how we're going to be uh, distributing and sharing the story of, uh, of the work that we're doing. I, th I, you know, I think the thing we always have to remember, and I, I, maybe I didn't say it loud, loud enough today, is what's different about a GRI report and a, a report that a corporation does 
of this nature is that it is met, if it's done correctly to the standards, it is a multi-stakeholder driven process. It starts external in, it, because that, again, that's the definition of what you're trying to accomplish here. It's how this business impacts the economy, people, health, et cetera. So it, it can't be inside a corporate boardroom thinking, well, these things are important to us. That's what we're gonna tell people about this year. Um, that's totally, reversed of how this has to happen. So, you know, if we continue to enrich this process, it isn't just disseminating reports out to people. It's, it is the conversation of the matters of significance and how they're with people that you do them together. This is the shift really, it's, you know, it's part of the societal change we're living in today to this multi-stakeholder environment. And not everyone likes it because you're losing control, if you will, of the message a bit, um, but that's what is meant to create the honesty of the conversation. But it's, it's very hard for people to do. There's no doubt about it. Thanks. Coach. I support. I support that. I, I think that's a more that has more integrity, you know, in terms of the approach. So I, I fully support that. Thanks. Thanks, Harry. Thanks, Sharon. One other board member, Bill. Uh, thank you, Harry. Uh, terrific report and uh, well done, beautifully done and, and extraordinarily informative and makes me once again proud to be a board member uh, on Calster's board. Uh, I just, you know, one of the things that uh, I've noticed is that, you know, we've been trying to figure out a way to uh, how uh, investors might measure financial risk uh, as a uh, element of, of analysis before they make investments. And I was uh, uh, heartened to see, you know, on page four of the, uh, of the uh, uh, document that preceded the report, um, that we've really been adopting TCFD within uh, our, our uh, decision making. And, you know, if somebody could sort of elaborate on that for the public, uh, more so than I think most of the board members are familiar with that. But since this is a, an open meeting and the public's listening, uh, if someone could uh, explain what that means when we make financial decisions here. Well, that, that of course is a climate disclosure, disclosure and it's a framework, it's not standard. So it's a little bit different how that fits it. And uh, Kirsty and her team really did make that change this year. And it's the, I, and it's, it, you're right, it's very significant because as part of our engagement campaigns, with all of our, um, the Climate Action 100 and all the other uh, environmental oriented campaigns, that is the ask, is that companies really do that scenario testing, stress test their organizations around climate change, find out what will be those financial implications from um, various um, uh, scenarios that will likely occur. So, um, you know, it's really upping your game, if you will, around those climate disclosures significantly. And that has become, uh, I think people really are recognizing that's the, the engine around climate disclosure frameworks right now is TCFD for sure. It, it's, it's, it's unfortunate we have all these acronyms and we're just constantly acronyming out all the time, but that is in fact the um, piece that accompanies the sustainability reporting. Great, thank you. Thanks, Bill. I don't see uh, any other hands. Um, so I want to thank the staff again for the report, the incredible work that we've been doing really under your leadership, Jack. I mean, you've been at the head of the, realm, uh, head of the ship for a long time. Uh, so thank you. Uh, I look forward to the board continuing this great work after uh, you move to a different place and time. Uh, and as we look, uh, look to the uh, strategic plan process that will be beginning shortly, as Cassandra mentioned. Um, I, for one, uh, will be leaning in quite heavily to all the work that we've been doing so far around sustainability, in particular, looking for opportunities to amplify our voices and our voice around the issue of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Uh, as I said to Sharon yesterday after the meeting, I said, you know, we don't address climate change you know, we know the existential threat to the earth, but what will happen will be the middle class and the poor will be left here and the super wealthy will be taken off to another 
planet someplace and the, just the inequities that exist. So we, we can do both. I think society is requiring us to do both. I think progressive leaders and corporations, nonprofits uh, are doing this type of work and they realize that it's not only the right thing to do morally, but from a business perspective, it's the right thing to do. This is really about mitigating risk and looking at uh, opportunities going forward. Uh, and the objective is really to pay benefits to teachers over the long run. So I'm thrilled that we've been part of this conversation and I look forward to the continued work on these initiatives uh, after you leave Jack and uh, your successor comes in. So thanks so much. Great. Jack, we'll go to your CEO report. Yeah, I just, uh, because of time, I'll just uh, give you a couple uh, thoughts that have uh, updating since we wrote the report to you, especially around our third leg of our three big projects, the uh, headquarters expansion. A uh, couple quick things and, and mostly favorable. Uh, we are set to uh, put in the uh, power next weekend. Um, and that's no small deal to get had work with PG&E to put in the permanent power um, for the new structure and uh, shutting down. It requires a shutdown and start up. And so we are all making all the operational um, support issues that have to take place for next weekend. So that looks good. So we're looking forward to that. Um, if you saw the details of the report, um, we made a conservative estimate to now consider the completion date, um, September 16th, four weeks out. Um, but um, I don't want you to get stuck on that date. Uh, we right now have uh, 21 weather days to the credit. And um, obviously uh, next winter we'll be working inside on the building. So they're relevant to now. So we're likely to have the advantage of some days there. We also see some other days to pick up around inspections. So there's some opportunity to pull that back so long as we get the final permit on a, by a specific time. Um, but since I wrote that report for you, the first three permits, there's four permits. The first three are now done. They are approved, it's over. So we are down to the uh, last permit and the last permit is, is critical because it is, it is the permit that allows us to do the interiors of the building. So we have put off doing some work that we probably could have gotten ahead of if we had had that fourth permit in place. Um, we have provided the materials over to the uh, state agency. So we will now work with them to hopefully get that fourth permit done. Um, but to be safe, we're going back now and scrubbing parts of the budget, still trying to figure some design issues that might give us some additional savings. But there is no suggestion at this point um, that there's a budgetary impact. So we're still focused on the budget that we set up for this project. Um, we're disappointed, uh, frankly, that, that several million dollars have been lost, if you will, through the contingency to these extended processes, but we will expect to still finish at this point. Uh, the building um, has, uh, we have a marketing brochure completed with JLL, our leasing agent. So the building is now being uh, marketed out to the community for, for space. And again, you know, I know in the investment committee and the, particularly around the real estate conversations you had yesterday, you heard broad generalizations about the rental market and leasing and office space. But, but let's always remember, you got to bring it back to the specific market you're in and who might be available for um, interest in your space. Um, our, again, our advantage in this is that we have some, a very nice class A office space and there are not other projects uh, um, that are non-governmental um, coming to market in Sacramento. So we, um, to the extent there is private sector interest in commercial space, our building would be considered a very prime location for that. And JLL will certainly be marketing in that area. And then the last point is we're, um, I know you've, you've, you've probed us a number of times about what is the work gonna look like? How is the space gonna look like given the COVID and, and all that? And, and there's just endless webinars on this topic. If, you're, if you get mail on this, every major consultancy is having some return to work discussion and most of them end in the same manner, which is, you know, we don't know. <laughs> we don't know what people are going to feel like. And then uh, some are going to come back. Some don't want to come back. I mean, the takeaways are, are repetitive. Um, but we also hear the worries starting to be amplified. You heard some of those today. 
around our, our pension solution project, around the team dynamics and, and, and not just that we have technology available, but do we have the cultural habits to use the technology? That's probably more important than having the technology available. Can you really integrate people effectively into group meetings and, and make good decisions? So what I wanted to mention is um, Lisa and her team and, and those of us on the steering committee for this project, we're going to go back in this truly the next couple of days and weeks and work with some of our designers and thought people in this area to again do some thinking about the office design in the headquarters expansion. Just there's just a lot going on there, and I think we need to take a second look. So we'll, uh, we'll we will do that. And the only other thing I, I wanted to mention in the report, it's only a couple of paragraphs, but it truly is significant. And that is around that survey we did of our staff around their satisfaction and engagement during this period. And you, you know, if you worked in human resources pre-COVID and we're looking at progressive issues and how to get a, a, a business working on all cylinders, you were always talking about engagement. There was endless conversations. How do you drive engagement scores? How do you get them higher, et cetera, et cetera. And we've always had, you know, we do these surveys every two years of all of our staff. We track everything, measure the changes. And our engagement score, um, which was 56 before COVID, was very high. We have only about 4% of the staff that are considered disengaged and the rest are what they term swing. And um, so you know, as a benchmark for an organization, we benchmark very high on engagement scores, but it's very hard to move that number where we always are working the data, trying to figure out what is the best lever on engagement score? How do you get a couple more points? So to our shock, um, and this, this isn't, we don't use a question asking an employee, are you engaged? People, some surveys do that. that. That is a whole different response. We actually ask six different questions that come together through a factor analysis into a, what we call a composite score. So it's a much better estimate of employee engagement than you might see in some other surveys. But this number has now jumped from 56 to 67%. I, I could have worked years at this to get this level of change. Um, and it is, it, it is that, so I want, I, it doesn't mean everything's perfect or, or the dynamics that I mentioned to you earlier aren't still of great concern to us because they are, um, but the engagement score is extremely high right now. So I want to make sure I called that out for you. And last point to make is on our members. Um, that survey data I shared with you last time about the number of early retirements and why people were retiring early, again, not because of injury, uh, which would be the normal illness and injury are the normal reasons people cite why they retire earlier than they want to. Um, but on our survey, it was the challenges of teaching during the dynamic. That was the number one driver of these early retirements that got considerable national press, considerable. And I just want to remember that normally when you're in a moment of economic stress, when it comes to retirement, people usually do the reverse. They, they, they're fearful they will not have enough money for retirement, um, or if they're in a 401k, worse yet, the market has, has tanked their investment, and they usually need to work longer. Um, so this is a very interesting market dynamic we have here with our membership. And we, I have some fresh data, California-based, from the National Institute of Retirement Security on broader perceptions of retirement related to COVID. And I want to, if we have time allows, next meeting, my last meeting with you, I, I'd like to be able to share that with you and, and talk a little bit about that, how people are thinking about retirement. Um, because it, it is, it, you know, this is the heart of our business. And we really need to understand these dynamics. So that was all I was going to... Um, Focus on, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Jack. So got to move that engagement needle after all these years. All it took was a global <laughs> pandemic and everyone working from home. Had we known that uh, earlier. Yeah. Uh, Sharon and Gail. <laughs> Sharon and Gail. <laughs> that was, that was, I needed to laugh, right? <laughs> Thank you, Harry. Um, yeah. 
Uh, Jack, I, I would welcome that report in May. Obviously, I've been following these numbers. Um, you know, I work on retirement issues with my local and even my friends, you know, that are stressing about teaching online. I mean, I have anecdotal stories of colleagues living down the street from me who are retiring this year because they're just done <laughs> with online. So, um, wow. but, so yeah, so I, I guess I would also underscore to your point, you know, having a, a defined benefit plan for active teachers and, and being at retirement age and be, knowing that you have some kind of financial security is huge. And then I, I would just shout out to, you know, CTA, CFT, you know, the faculty associations through Triple um, you know, that those organizations do really do provide a lot of support to teachers as well so that, you um, you know, if you if you are retirement age and you can financially make that decision for yourself, there are some protections in place for the hard work you've done through your entire career. So I would welcome hearing more of that information. I do think this is what we do. You know, we, you know, right. it's about retirement of teachers and making sure they have a secure retirement and retire with dignity. So um, I would welcome that, Mr. Chair, to add that to the agenda for, for May and I'd love to hear that information. So thanks, Jack. And don't keep talking about your last meeting because I already cried. I know. Oh. <laughs> I know. I know. Yeah. Gail and then Joy. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And Jack, thank you for answering the first question that you knew I was going to ask about budget. I think that's great. Good job on that. Have all of these, I, I wasn't quite clear on the fire marshal issues that you wrote about. Um, have they all been resolved and they're being resubmitted and we think we're good on that? Is that sort of what I understood? Uh, on, well, now we have uh, on permits one through three, they had gone back and asked questions on different ones and we had to make some adjustments, but they are Sealed, sealed, delivered, finished. Okay. So the only thing left is, and then you, we had to resubmit permit four, which is the interiors. That's been done, and now we need to work with them for a number of weeks to work through that last permit. Um, so one is we want. There's two parts to that that you know I'm always thinking what could go wrong. Uh, the two things that could go wrong are it takes longer than they've committed to do it, and number two that they identify things that you know, need alteration in the plans and cost money. And that, that does happen for sure. Um, but, uh, you know, we've been finding a few savings pots, you know, which, you know, you constantly redesign, look for savings. And so, so that's why I'm not, I'm not losing sleep on the budget at this point, you know, right now we're just okay where we Great. are. Okay. Good to hear. And you'll just keep us posted if you start to lose sleep on the budget. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Joy. Thank you, um, Harry. And uh, it just maybe to follow up on Gail's question, just Jack to you know keep us informed. Um, you know, if you see things moving in a direction that is um, that does you know raise your blood pressure or make you more concerned. Um, but I just wanted to take a minute as as someone who is also in an organization that has um, surveys of our employees. Um, it sounds like constructed similar to what you're talking about. Um, I, I, it is no easy feat to move the needle on some of those items and to move it um, with the volume that you did. So um, just I just want to you know commend you and um, Cassandra and Chris and all of the leaders at Calsters for um, for doing that. So thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you very much. Yep. Yep. No, you know, you know, again, on the construction, normally we would be worried about things related to construction. You know, that's what's kind of interesting here. Things that don't go right. You know, concrete that doesn't pour right, all the design issues that happen in buildings. And I just want to make sure, I, I never talked to you about that, I realized, because it's going so well. And it just, you know, the construction part is really, we're really hunkered down and focused on it. We have constant meetings, our staff, and 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 oversight so that is going well um but you know we're all becoming experts in permitting now and so that's that is the issue yeah Bill. well i just want to uh commend jack and and staff and and also the consultants uh on sort of uh threading the needle with the fire marshal as uh, they've been at this for a, a long while and sharon and i have the the uh, dubious uh, duty of, of sort of overseeing this for the board. And I can tell you that uh, there's been a lot of thought and, and, uh, and analysis put in uh, by uh, staff and our consultant on how to deal with the fire marshal. And 
And I think that uh, they came up with our last meeting, which was uh, maybe a week or 10 days ago with uh, Jack and the consultant uh, uh, and, and staff, uh, it, it was very encouraging. Uh, I think the engagement of uh, a, a consultant that has you know, worked very closely with the fire marshal's office, I think is uh, been a very good decision. And I think Sharon, I, I, I don't wanna speak for you, but I think we both felt you know, very encouraged and we're doing everything that can be done to uh, remedy the problem uh, or the, the challenge, not so much the problem. And so thank you very much uh, to everybody that's been pulling on the oars because you've done a good job as far as I'm concerned. Thanks. And, thank and I'm sure Sharon too. Thank you. Thanks, Bill. Okay, Jack. Thanks. Right. Thanks, right. everyone. Um, don't believe we have any committee reports that if the staff, are there any committee reports that need to be read into the record? No, there are none. Thanks, no, Brian. None. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Ms. Bell. Uh, the item 8B through 8E as in Edward are consent items. Does anyone want to pull any of the consent items? Okay, seeing none. Um, those items are approved as presented, um, including the adoption of the two-year calendar. And if you read the write-up, um, there might be times where we have to be a little flexible over the next couple of years as we learn more, uh, one, about what type of, uh, what can and cannot be done remotely, as well as what the demands will be on our schedule. Uh, but those two day, uh, over the next two years, are all there for us to put on our personal calendars and work calendars. Let me see what's next here. Um, uh, Ms. Bell, were there any items referred uh, by the committee for board direction? Yeah, um, I had one question regarding um, specific questions that Ms. Miller made to CGI and I can uh, read those to you. Um, now, this information, I guess the option was given to CGI to submit in writing. This information would really need to be verified by the project team, IVV and IPOC. And so I wanted to just clarify um, how you wanted to receive the information. Would you like me to um, read what I wrote, Ms. Miller? Um, Cause you had asked- I the chair on, on that. I'm sorry, I didn't- Okay. But please, yeah. Sure. So you had asked, um, you know, about starting uh, UAT and CAT, like um, for their explanation about that and also the timing and the cost associated with the delays. So how would you like to handle this information? Michelle? Yeah, I think, I think uh, in a, a regular, the regular updates that we receive okay. uh, on the, pro the overall project. And then of course, Ms. Miller can reach out to staff directly on any of the specifics that are not there. But I think the overall message that we wanted to share was uh, the commitment to quality as well as still being fiscally uh, prudent and a responsible organization. Gail, if there's anything specific that you need, are you comfortable with that going back? Yeah, going I, think back I, yeah mm -hmm. I think Ms. Bella kind of got the specificity just around, there, there just seems to be a little discrepancy between the user acceptance test and the contract the contractor acceptance test and the timing of those two. The, and that's sort of the very specific question. I just wanna make sure we're really thoughtful about how the interplay between those two and the timing. But again, I mean, I would love just a quick email on that. I just didn't know, cause I asked for it here. If maybe everyone wanted to see that. Why don't, why don't, why doesn't staff uh, follow up directly with Ms. Miller and then uh, to the extent that's necessary incorporated in the next update to the full board. Yeah. Thank you. That's Thank all. you. Does that work, Gail? Okay, great. Okay. Um, no, I don't believe there's any new business or review of information requests. The draft agenda for the next meeting, we have the actuarial reports. There's the annual election of the chair and vice chair of the board, as well as the committee assignments. So, uh, Sharon and I would encourage you to begin to think about as we have uh, the committees that you would like to serve on and in particular committees that you would like to chair or vice chair because those assignments get made so that uh, they're in place starting July 1st. 
Anything else, uh, Jack, that we want to highlight from the draft agenda? Well, ju just that from your prior conversation, that comp item right now is kind of narrowly defined as the labor market uh, piece. And uh, I haven't seen the data, so I don't know how complicated that conversation will be. Last time we did it, it was pretty succinct because the data didn't move much, but um, I don't know yet. But now if, you're, if we're adding more of a, another round of LTIP, I just I think we need to recognize that's going to grow that that item on your time. So I, I at a minimum, just, you know, I can tell looking at the um, committee, not just this committee, but not just the board, but the committees, I think yeah, this, you've reserved three days for May and you will very likely need all three days on your calendar, even though you're moving to two days uh, for the next fiscal year. Uh, because I, this would look to me like you're gonna need, just like you do for investment committee, Harry, this looks like you need a full two plus two Dave, you're going to do all the valuations and you're going yeah. to do comp items and other stuff. I, I just think this is a day as well. And then the third day would be, you've got some committees that need to meet too, I believe. So, um, yep. Thanks, Jack. So that'd be my take. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, yeah. Good catch there. So we really need to be thinking about, it's going to be a three day meeting in May, uh, sticking yeah. to the two, two, and two format as closely as we possibly can. Okay. Yep. Thank okay. you. Yep. Um, opportunities for statement from the public. Samantha, do we have any members of this public that would like to address us? Well, we have one member of the public in queue. Yeah, let's bring them on. Our first caller um, will be Sandy. Sandy, go ahead. Hi, this is Sandy Keaton. Sharon, I, I really want to thank you for the comments that you made. I appreciate them um, to the staff who are amazing, and also to all the educators who have kept the schools open, even though the buildings are closed. But I truly would like to thank all of you on the board. I think you've just been doing an amazing job. I realize how much time you spend reading, answering questions, um, researching questions, and looking at all the issues that are facing us. So. My comment is thank you to all for all that you've done for the educators of California. Thanks. And thank you, Dr. Keaton, for taking time to call in and uh, recognize our work. It's an honor and a privilege to serve on this board. And thank you for all that you do. Um, so that concludes the statements from the public. We are, uh, the GRI report went, ran uh, over that longer than we had anticipated and the LTIP conversation went as long as anticipated. So we're, you know, we're running a little bit behind schedule. So keeping that in mind, um, I would like to take a, it's uh, 11.37. Why don't we take a 10, uh, an eight minute break and come back at 11.45, if that's okay. Eight minutes, 11.45 in closed session. And when we come back into closed session, we're going to start with the um, search committee, full board search committee update. So that means a lot of people that are on this call or at this meeting that are not visible do not need to come back in at that time. And I would anticipate that that item will take 15 to 30 <coughs> minutes. Um, so we're gonna come back in at 11.45 search committee um, and that would include the full board, Melissa, Egon Zendler, and I believe, uh, and Amy McDuffie. So we'll see everybody in eight minutes. Great. Thanks so much, Sharon Hendricks, Vice Chair of the Board. I'm just reporting out from our regular board closed session that we have nothing, uh, nothing to report. So thank you. And I believe Arm will start at 145. Great. Thanks.